All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Sayo Township Planning Commission for June 12th, 2023. If you'll join me in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh, no. That's surprising. I was wondering who's there. Yeah. You could text her. Yeah. And just say this is Chris. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> um Chris, will you do a, a roll call? Yes. Please? Okay. Commissioner Sharma. Present. Commissioner Chang, present. Uh Commissioner Riser. Present. And Commissioner Culbertson. Present. And, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Hyde. Present. Right. And we do expect Commissioner Moore. Um, the quorum and I'll move to adoption of the agenda. I would, are you moving or are you asking me to move it? Go, please move it. I move the agenda. Okay. All right, move and support for the agenda is posted. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Commissioner Moore already just joined voting. us. Voting? Yeah, we're already voting. Uh, communications and correspondence. Um, if there um, are uh, several pieces of communication um, in the upload section, um, I think they all relate, relate to the KFC. Um, any other communications um, that were sent to the planning commission members that didn't get forwarded? Oh yes, and then um, Trustee Noel just emailed her um, newsletter article for everyone and that'll be uploaded under correspondence as well. And that was just a, a summary of the current testing or the, the last set of testing for the world. Um, anyone else have any other communications? Report that I emailed to folks this afternoon. I tend to do. It I didn't get it. My outbox. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, any other uh, correspondence to report? All right. Then we'll move on. Um, presentations requested by the planning commission. Um, we have uh, plan we have some um, two presentations. Uh, we're going to keep those to uh, no more than fifteen minutes. Um, and um, one is on the uh, utilities planning, and I don't know who from OHM is going to do that one. And then we'll hear from Roger Rail, who um, has been um, sort of tracking and working on uh, the Gelman plume issue for about 30 years. So with that, um, it, who do we have from OHM? Hi, Jan. It'll be me leading the discussion primarily. All right, great. Welcome. Thank you. All right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent. All right. So as most of you know, I am Sally Boss with OHM. I am one of the township engineers. I've been the township engineer for over 10 years at SIO now. Um, Matt Parks is also online. He's been with SIO for almost 20 years. And then we also have Stacy Monty online. Um, so if you have any questions, all three of us are here to answer. Um, so as some of you know, we have a team that works in SIO. Quick overview, Kent Early was our former SIO Township principal. He's now moved up to OHM COO position. So Matt has stepped up into principal. And then Stacy and myself are your client representatives. I'm also a project manager. Stacy is the one who handles most of the site reviews. Um, all the site development reviews go through her and her team. We also have Matt Kennedy, who is our facilities project engineer. He's been very involved in your sewer pump stations and some of your water work, as well as various other experts. Um, and then of course we have Chris Tonikowski, who's our field client rep. He oversees all of the inspection for all of the site and in-house development. So kind of the timeline of what the township has done with OHM in the past 20 some years. Um, 1999 to 2009 was mostly studies, planning and assessment years. We did a lot of studies at that point. And then 2010 through 2019 was the implementation year. So all the projects were identified in those studies were then implemented. And now we're kind of back to 
the study period again, but we're also doing impl implementation at the same time. So we kind of do a study and then implement, study then implement, and so on and so forth. So touching on the water contract, because I know water and sewer has been a very large topic of discussion in the township race recently. The current water contract was signed June 9th of 1994. It has an initial 20 year term. It auto renews for 15 years after that. The terms of the agreement state that it has to have a five year notice required prior to the termination of the contract. And that can be from either SIO or the city of Ann Arbor. Um, it, the contract limits the water service to the instantaneous draw rate, which is equivalent to 4.4 million gallons per day. Um, that would be the most you could ever pull from Ann Arbor. However, additional storage, so more water towers could be added to help mitigate those peak demands. So you shouldn't ever hit this because there's always the ability to add more water. So honestly, water service is not a concern at this time. Um, the service area that is outlined in the contract is everything within this black line. And I know there's been some confusion on the maps. So this is the one that's in the contract with Ann Arbor. Anything within the black line can be serviced by water main within the contract. Um, there's also a provision in the contract to share any construction costs in the city improvements that needed be, might be needed to supply the township water needs. Uh, and then there's two connection points. There's one at Jackson Road and Wagner, and then there's one on Liberty Road as well. Um, and we'll show you the map of kind of the service districts and all of that coming up. So as I mentioned, because of the water service draw, it's really limited to instantaneous peak demand. You can always bring that down with more water towers and some other mitigation measures. So in all honesty, water service capacity is not a concern at this point. It's more yeah. on the side. Sally, just uh, just real quick, so the planning commission understands too. Um, you know, you mentioned sharing any construction costs when the um, water and water contract was discussed and renewed. Um, SIO actually has an ongoing uh, DWRF uh, loan payment going on right now that the township making payments on, and that was to upsize a project called Pipes One, Two, and Three, um, and those were actually physically infrastructure built in Ann Arbor to help serve the west side of Ann Arbor, but primarily to service SIO Township. And that construction has been completed and SIO is still paying that bill on that. So if you want any more specific detail on that, um, that's one of the projects that I worked on when I first started working with SIO back in like 2005, six and seven. Um, so anyway, then, and, and that just holds true with the contract when the contract was being looked at and SIO needed additional capacity, that was a major project that that got um, that got pushed through. So SIO could basically service the area outlined in black and also hit, uh, be able to provide, Ann Arbor be able to provide that 4.4 million gallons per day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've all seen the contract service area map. I know this next map has been floating around and it's created a lot of confusion. This map with the green outline is just a snapshot from October of 2012 of the areas that were currently serviced with water main. So this is not the limits of the service area. This is just what was serviced in October of 2012, what currently had water. So it's truly that outlined black area that is your water service contract district. Um, and one of the things that we do to help appease Eagle and the city of Ann Arbor is we do a water system master plan every five years. It is required by Eagle of all communities, not just SIO. Um, we last updated it in 2021. It was a little delayed by COVID and all of that. So it was supposed to be done in 2020. Eagle got with the whole shutdown thing. We It got delayed in the service in the submittal. Um, and that was okay. We worked that out with Eagle. That was no big deal. Um, so we are due for an update in 2025. And what this water system master plan includes is a water liability study, a general plan, and an asset management plan. So the asset management plan was recently added. And that's kind of what makes this the whole water system master plan overall. So all three of those parts, um, there's a lot of analysis that goes into it. It's almost a 200 page document. Your, utility, your utilities department has it if you really want to read through it all. 
Um, but basically all that analysis goes in to help us develop five-year and 20-year capital improvement plans, as well as identify any needs that are immediate needs to be addressed. Sally? So we have a question, Sally. Yes. Is that approved by the township board? I don't know if they actually ever like pass it. There's no resolution or anything necessary, but we have presented it. Um, mm -hmm. So it's provided to the utility director. Utility director reviews it. We refine it, edit it. Um, and then as it's submitted to Eagle, um, previous boards have requested a presentation. Um, and I believe we gave probably some something close to what we're doing tonight uh, to the board back in 2021. But I don't we think did. It, it, it's required or the board has actually ever approved it. But that's something that you guys could, or the Sio Township Board could make part of their policy if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. I don't see any okay. reason why you, you you need to, but there's no reason not to either. Okay, thank you. So Matt and Sally, with respect to water, it's John Reiser, good evening. 1994 plus 20, that took us to 2014 and it auto renewed. So we have until 2029 for water, is that correct? Correct. And it will auto renew another 15 years unless notice was given five years prior. So we've got water until 2029. No. Um, and if, sure, it, if it auto renews, you mean? It'll, and then it'll auto renew after that unless we get notice or give notice. Correct. So safely through 2029, it'll auto renew. And we have that up to generally Miller Road slash Dexter Ann Arbor Road, correct? Yes. Yeah, so let me flip that back. So yes, so you're all the way up here, Dexter Ann Arbor, Miller, yeah. that's the north end. So housing development uh, proposed on Miller Road on the south side would presumably have water, whereas if it were north of Miller Road, they wouldn't. Is that correct? Correct. Without a contract modification. Unless, a contract, unless you, yes. Yeah, unless you modify it with the Ann Arbor uh, Just in big picture terms, that's, that's the import of that. Correct. Okay. Correct. And obviously there's no water main up on Miller Road right now, so they would have to bring it, but they would be allowed to bring it under the contract. All right. All right. Thank you. So I'm not sure I followed you. John. <laughs> yeah. Um, so our contract is up in 2024. It will auto, not 2029, 2024. It will automatically it renew unless we indicate otherwise for another 15 years. Page 15. 1994. In 20 plus, years. Plus 20 years. That would be 2024. Are you sure in that? <laughs> no, it would be 2014. 2014, so it's auto-renewed already. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. In her defense, she's a lawyer. She's not responsible <laughs> for doing that. <laughs> okay. So back to the water master plan. The I included a map of the capital improvements plan, so you can see what it includes. Things in green were in our five year, things in, I'll call it pink, maroon, I don't know what to call it color, um, are your 20 year. And this this mimics previous submittals. We have to submit these every five years. So this map pretty much matches the last three or four updates. Um, so you can see here on the south side, you can see the Liberty Road water main, which was performed in conjunction with Sile View. Um, Trailwoods and Woodview also contributed to this project. So that's currently under construction. That's going to hopefully be done this year. Um, we're working through startup and a few things like that. Um, the other ones were the Jackson Road water valve replacement. That's been talked about a couple of times over the last 10 years. Um, we've put a few, the utilities department has worked with Ann Arbor. They've put a few band-aids on it. There's still some work to be done, but it is working the way it should be right now. Um, there are always improvements that can be done, and I'll touch on that in the next slide. Um, and then you can see there's some 20-year loops on the north end of the township, the Baker Stabler Road loop, the 94 Z loop, and then the North Water Main loop, which we've been talking about in terms of um, the Gelman plume here. Um, and I'm sure Roger can touch on that a little bit more. And then there's also a water tower down in the WISD district. And then you have control upgrades at the pump stations and the booster stations and things like that. So um, you can also see the township has two pressure service districts that's in the pink shading and the yellow shading. Basically all that means is 
that the Wagner booster station or the Wagner booster station and the Liberty booster station, those feed the yellow. That's your WISD or the Uplands district, as you may hear it called. Um, Wagner and Liberty switch off about every six weeks. That's how they boost the water pressure to get to that side of the township because of elevation. Everything else in pink is fed off of the main Jackson Road valve and the water tower. So any questions on water before I move to sewer? I have a question. Yes, so yes. Th those items on your left bottom, those, I believe, have those been completed, those five-year CIPs? No, the Liberty Road water main and valve is underway. The I believe the Jackson Road water tower maintenance has been done, uh, but the Jackson Road control valve has not yet been completed. All righty. The reason the valve, the reason the valve was uh, Ann Arbor just got done doing a um, meter switch out, and the timing was not uh, preferred to be able to um, do that at the same time, and the coordination between the city and the township didn't happen um, congruently. So, it's uh, it's probably the next vital thing that needs to be done within the next few years. Agreed. Okay, moving on to sewer. It was signed April 2015. Um, it's valid through December of 2024. So unless written notice of change is provided by the end of this year, so December 31st, 2023, the agreement automatically extends 10 years. And if auto it, so that continues on, it would be extended to 2034. But if there's no notice given by the end of 33, then it would extend again um, to 2020, 2044. Um, and if automatic extensions continue until 2044 with no new negotiations, it enters a period where it renews for a year and then another year and then another year while a new contract is negotiated with the city. So there is, this won't auto renew in, in perpetuity like the water contract does. It will auto renew for another 20 years or so, and then it has to be renegotiated. Um, so service area modifications require written consent of both parties. We did this back in 2014. It took a couple of years to get the agreement through. Um, there were projects that had to be done and things like that. So this one updated accepts 2.05 million gallons per day. That's an average on a monthly basis. So it's not, they don't measure a specific day. They take an average, which in terms of REUs, because I know we talk about REUs a lot in engineering, um, that's about 6,800 REUs. You've heard us talk about remaining capacity. We're at about 1,200, 12 to 1,300 remaining REUs right now. Um, and the way we've come up with that is we do periodic sanitary sewer metering to help true up remaining capacity because with low flow toilets and low flow shower heads and things like that, um, we work off of Ann Arbor Table A, which assumes one household uses about 300 gallons per day. It's probably less than that, which is why we like to do these true up meterings about every five, eight years. Um, that lets us kind of reset the clock with both Ann Arbor and with Eagle on where the remaining capacity is because it gives us a true, not a theoretical, it gives us an actual flow to work off of. Um, there's also a cost sharing in here of city sanitary sewer improvements that would serve both the township and the city. One of those cost sharing projects was the sanitary sewer lining south of the outfall that was done back in, I believe, 2014, 2015, right about when this was going in. Um, so that kind of projects, again, like we have to cost share with the city of Ann Arbor because we're using their infrastructure. I have a question. Yes. Yeah. So back on about the water contract, you say the equivalent to 4.4 MGD. What does MGD stand for? Millions of gallons per day. And with regard to the sewer contract, we refer to 2.05 MGD. Correct. That's, that's the same? Yes. One minute, Sally. <laughs> and then I just have one. Can you tell me REUs, what does that stand for? Residential equivalent units. So essentially what one REU is, is it's 300 gallons per day. So everything gets to, and 300 gallons per day is roughly what a single family home uses theoretically. So when we're talking 
commercial or industrial, we compare everything back to what a single family home would use. So basically a residential equivalent unit or an REU, if you say, oh, this restaurant's gonna use 24 REUs, it's essentially mm -hmm. saying it's going to be the equivalent of 24 single family homes in terms of water and sewer usage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is your current sewer map in the contract. These are the areas that can be serviced by sewer. Um, and the colors here just tell you the Jackson Road District, the Intermediate School District, and the Walnut Ridge District. Um, and Walnut Ridge is kind of up there on its own. It's got its own connection point, so on and so forth. Again, there's two sewer connection points. There's one at Jackson, there's one at Liberty. Um, but this is your map. And then for comparison purposes, this is what your maps look like overlaid. So the blue shading is your water district and it goes off the map a little bit in that upper left corner. Um, and then the green is your sewer map and the purple is city of Ann Arbor. So you can see where the water and sewer maps overlap in that cross hatching. And then real quick, oh, questions. Try to wrap up. Yes, yep, I only have two more slides. Um, so our upcoming tasks, as we've talked about, the in terms of water main, the Liberty Road water main construction is ongoing. Basically, we only have left is the pressure relief valve startup and calibration. We'll have a master plan reliability study update coming up in 2025. And then, as Matt mentioned, the Jackson Road valve improvements, where we're going to put in a variable frequency drive to help it run more smoothly and prevent some water hammer issues. Um, from the valve operation. And then sanitary sewer, we're currently working to finalize the Jackson Road force main study and pump station study. We'll have re-metering. We'll probably want to do that late 24, early 25. Um, that'll help us true up the remaining capacity. And then um, we are due for more sewer lining and manhole rehabilitation projects. We have not done any of those in almost 10 years now. Um, the last one was in 2014, 2015. Um, that helps keep your sewer dry and helps, again, conserve capacity for actual usage instead of groundwater or stormwater leaking in. Um, so in terms of that, we talk a lot about PUDs and what they can do for public benefits. These are projects that they could contribute to in terms of utilities. Um, as I mentioned, Woodview, Trailwood, Sioview, they've all provided contributions towards some of these projects. Um, and obviously we could use more contributions towards that. And then last but not least, um, the engineering standards are outdated. They were last updated in 20, 2007. Um, basically it's time to do this. We should do this about every 10 years um, just to keep up with the information, changing industry practices, best practices like the new water rely or the water resources commission stormwater guidelines. Um, and also we can add in things like sustainability practices, which I know the planning commission is very intent on keeping those. We can add some of that into the engineering design standard. So that is coming. Um, we've submitted a proposal for that to the township. We'll re-up that if we need to once the fiscal, now that we're in the new fiscal year, um, and we can work with the utilities department and the township staff to get that done. So that is all I have. If anybody has any last questions, we're happy to answer them. Otherwise, um, I'll turn it over to Roger. Okay, good question, Mr. Rakesh. Uh, so you were explaining about the agreement with Ann Arbor, million gallons per day, et cetera, et cetera. So the growth we see inside Township or, or we hope to see, how does that contract that million gallons per day number be affected and what kind of issues could be faced with Ann Arbor in terms of the contract. I mean, are we running kind of, could, could there be a situation where we are um, uh, above the threshold or something like that? Is that a risk? Could there there be is. A risk? Could, I mean, could there be a risk? Not a risk. There could be a risk. Um, that's why we track it. That's why we do the re-metering every five to 10 years, five to eight years um, to make sure we're staying within that because there can be fines and retribution type things from exceeding those contracts. So if we were getting close, then we would need to renegotiate and move forward with that whole process, which is multi-years and usually rather expensive. Um, but that's one of the reasons we track it, and this is why we talk about REU so much. This has been one of the township's tools to control development and kind of target it towards Jackson Road in the past. 
Um, but outside the sewer district, then you're looking at individual septics, you're looking at these package treatment plants, uh, that type of thing. So there is a risk eventually of running out, running out of capacity without renegotiating. Um, but it also depends on what the city has available. And are you REU? Could be a single family home or a condo or an apartment. It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, if they are smaller apartments, if they're under, I believe it's 800 square feet, it's a partial REU. So there is, um, and I can send you Ann Arbor Table A that gives you the breakdown of what everything relates to. Um, but if they are small apartments, they are, I believe it's like 0.6 or 0.8 REUs instead of one single family home. But if they're larger, over a thousand square feet apartments, then they count as a single family home. And that's all theoretical. So that's why Correct. Sally points out the fact that we remeter. Eagle has been very good to work with. And as long as we're showing actual and we're doing things like manhole rehab and we're able to eliminate infiltration and flow from the system, that's that many more connections that can be made um, in, in, in the Jackson Road or in that sewer service district area. So, so Matt and Sally, it's John Reiser. Um, We've got about 1,200 REUs left. Have, has any of that been allocated to projects which haven't gone online, or does the 1,200, is that the net of what we have left in our sewer district? The 1,200 is net of what you have left. We did factor in the rest of Trailwoods and Woodview, so those are already out of okay. the 1,200. So the 1,200 is truly representative of what's left not including anything that's already been approved and is under construction and if we have right. until the end of this year december 31st 2023 to get a new contract or to extend it for 10 years the question they have is is 1200 likely to go to last over 10 years based on the development um, you know, line that we've been on or do we need to start thinking about how we're going to need more than 1,200 or more than 2.05 million? Can we take that to a 2.1 or 2.25? Or can we get that number up? Or are there, are there things that can be done structurally? I know holding tanks or something, um, or, or, or does that not work like it can with water towers? Or the work amounts? We looked at that a little bit. Um, John and we we did a Jackson Road study with the Force Main as well as looked at the pump station at Z Road there and uh, looked at the wet well. So your yeah your con contract capacity is at about twelve hundred. You actually have a physical capacity that's a little bit below that even. So you're going to start running into problems. I would guess in the next ten years you you'll be out of capacity probably in the next three to four years or. I would say as soon as you've complete that next metering, that would be the time to kind of look at it as well as your master plan. And I mean, your, when I say that you're planning master plan and do a, a sewer master plan that coincides with that. Um, Carla Wartman and OHM did a, um, a study a while back um, when we worked um, with IO when you're negotiating with Ann Arbor to come up with the requested amount that's in the um, actual uh, contract now and that was based on a theoretical build out of Jackson Road um, what it didn't account for was expansion of that sewer district um, so we kind of looked at if we were to build out Jackson Road and we had some kind of 60 percent build out with two-story buildings more office um, etc um, we would be good for the next 10 to 15 years um, but what we're seeing is higher density, mixed uses, more restaurants, um, Baker Road now becoming kind of a commercial hub where we thought maybe more R&D, which wouldn't use as much. So we are seeing a little bit of a different um, dynamic happening. And so all that should be looked at probably in the next three to five years um, seriously, because it will, like Sally said, take a good two years to sit down with Ann Arbor and renegotiate a contract and get Eagle involved but if, if we re up by December 31st of this year for 10 years, then what right do we have under the contract to come back and say, hey, I know we, we agreed in December of 2023, but we really need more because we've got density on the west side of, 
western edge of Jackson Road. Well, what if we need more, but we've already re upped for 10 years? Are we? You are can we still go this? back and negotiate. You just have to provide. So you can renegotiate any time. You just have to notice before like the next renewal period. So even though it says December 1st, 20 or December 31st, 2023, you could re-up for the next 10 years, but then notice them five years from now and say, hey, we want to renegotiate before it re-ups the next time. And the, and the one thing that we have to be extra careful of is you'll see on our review letters that Stacey and Sally put out, you'll put on the front page, there's a lot of times they'll say requested REUs and then I'll say allocated REUs. A lot of people... Uh, properties paid into a special assessment and pre-purchased REUs. And so they have some rights to that. Um, some properties don't have any and some properties don't have as, not, as much as they need. You do want to be careful because at some point you could be in a situation where you do have to do a moratorium on you know any more development until you get something renegotiated. But you want to make sure that you have at least enough capacity for some of those properties that pre-purchased. Um, so that can, and we spent a lot of time with previous boards and, you know, previous city managers going all the way back to like Daryl Fetcho and um, others um, going way back on kind of analyzing this and working with Eagle. And that was the root of the renegotiation with Ann Arbor to kind of get us, you know, through, through today and probably the next 10 years, but going into 2030 and beyond, that's, that's really where we need to think about how SIO is going to develop. So I presume the allocated REUs are those that are purchased, pre-purchased. Correct. And those were all done in like 1985. I think there was an SAD role for the expansion of the sewer system. And the property numbers were updated in 2006, I want to say, Matt. I think that's the conversion date on it. But yeah, it was originally purchased, like you said, in 1985. So we're still working off of those purchased in data and those are purchased through their property taxes i mean that's i think i heard you say that it was a special assessment so people would opt in or or not opt in and to be honest i don't we don't see much of that behind the scenes stuff but there is an sad role it's all on a spreadsheet um it would probably be good to get that onto a modern day gis at some point um but and a master plan. Yeah. Oh, so, REU, residential, what is the conversion to a business unit, like a shop, a dealership? How does that work? It varies depending on the use. So like a restaurant, I believe a fast food restaurant is like 40 gallons per day per seat. A office is 0.06 REUs per square foot of gross area. Um, there's a whole, I mean, there's a the list of okay. 30 yes different categories i can send it out to jan and she can distribute it um okay. if that we were you said, we refer to it i thought you said earlier it was a, like 10 reus 10 times the reus of a residential unit something you said earlier it, it can be i used an example of say a restaurant has so many seats that it equals out the math equals out to 20 oh, reus yeah. i just pulled a number off of one that we re used recently um, so I can she can send us the table that that yep. is yes. so there's a yeah, table. We call it we call it Ann Arbor Table A, and the reason why we call it that is that's what they call it, and the reason why we use that is it, it puts us on an apples to apples with them. So when we're talking about theoretical capacity, we're not using a totally different um, theoretical calculation system than Ann Arbor uses. We we want to be consistent with them. So here, yeah, I pulled it up real quick. So here's, that's small, I didn't realize. But so here's the single family residence. Two family duplex would be two. And then you can see like there's a wide variety of fear and math calculations that goes into it. Um, and Jan, I can email this to you. That's not a problem. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. And th that'll be really helpful for our discussion at our next meeting about planning for Jackson Road. So, Stacy, Matt, and so much for wrapping it up. See, and well, I have a question. We're getting demand for development north of uh, 94. We're getting demand for development north of the sewer district, um, and we need to plan for that as a planning commission, as a township. 
What recommendations do you have? Do we say no to these people? Do we say put in private sewers? Or do we punch in a sewer? Do, you know, what's the, where, where are we going to be in 10, 15, 20 years with respect to our sewer and where we're able to have development? Because where we have development, unless it's septic or unless it's private sewer system, then we're kind of, we're kind of bound to this blue, this blue map. Is that generally the case? I mean, that's really a land development policy question, John. I mean, we, we, we're the engineers. We can tell you what you do if you so wish to serve them with public sewer and what size it needs to be and what kind of infrastructure. I, you can but tell I mean, me how, it, much, how much pipe and how thick it's got to be. Exactly. But it's up to us to figure out where to put it and how to finance it. And who yeah, and, it. It, and there's risks, right? I mean, the private package plant, some communities are completely comfortable and are okay with that. Some communities are not. And honestly, SIO has dealt with this just recently with Heritage Encore. So it just depends on what you want your township to be and feel and look like. And, and that's a land use policy that really engineers shouldn't be the ones dictating that. That's a, that's a, that's a master plan question. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to Roger. Uh, actually, before I do my presentation, I had a couple questions for the engineers. Um, how many uh, REUs would be necessary to handle all the light blue area? A lot. <laughs> yeah. um, we mean, haven't done that a... calculation, but I mean, it's mostly large acreage, single family residential, but you know, to handle what's there today versus what could theoretically be built there are two different numbers. But I mean, easily you could double that 6,800 REUs um, just to handle the area outside. Um, but it just, again, it kind of boils down to what, what could go there? What, how densely could you develop it? So you'd need um, more water and definitely need more sewer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And right now yeah. all, that's, all that is service by well and septic today, right? But right. if you were to connect right. them up to the municipal system, then that would something, I mean, it would be fairly easy task to take GIS, calculate the parcels, how many single family homes, right. and then right. calculate an REU number. But yeah, I was to figure ask. out how it could be developed. This, I just want to interrupt because we have a really long agenda tonight. And even though this is important, it's probably more important to some of the discussion we're going to have next our next session. Well, that's so, why I wanted to I, I wanted yeah. to get it right before I before I start my presentation. The other okay. quick question was, uh, how does the uh, SIO's actual REUs for residential compare with the theoretical estimate? We figure that every time we true up, and honestly, it's fairly accurate. Um, it and actually, every time we do true up, it we seem to gain a little bit more because I think the table A is a little conservative. Oh, okay. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Roger. Yeah, let me share my screen. Ray went queued up here. So I'm just going to step through some uh, Google Earth images, screenshots, so it can go quicker. Okay, so you should be seeing a shot of the plume with the key. We are. Yeah. Then, uh, I'm just gonna give you. I mean, this is what it, this is. Uh, 2022, the last Gelman uh, map that uh, was drawn. Um, so you have these really high concentrations and some concentrations that are above the EPA standards throughout. And then uh, the original prohibition zone to the east for the city, just wanted to give you an idea where you couldn't have wells east of Wagner. And that got expanded to the Evergreen area, which everybody in Sio knows because this used to be Sio Township. That got annexed to the city. And then with the latest um, new expanded prohibition zone, it went more to the north and more to the south with the tightening up of the standards from 85 to 
And while this is up here, uh, just to point out that the um, this area here, of course, is the KFC property. If the prohibition zone was in effect for the western side, everything west of Wagner Road here, uh, this area would be in a prohibition zone based on what we've seen to the east. So everybody should keep that in mind that if if this if these were on wells, um, you know the. <laughs> The prohibition zone would extend beyond where the KFC property is. Is uh... last word you mean? I'm sorry. It would extend far beyond where it is now, westward. Well, I'm, I'm, they're not going to expand the prohibition zone yet to make it so you can't have any wells. But that's what happened here, and the reason they could do it here is because everybody was in the city limits and supposedly, supposedly was on city water. Of course, they found handfuls of wells where they, they were on city water, but they're still using the wells. And even in Sio, we found that. We found that, you know, uh, Weber's was using a well for a non-recirculating uh, or a, a heat pump and they were dumping it and it got into the storm drain and it got into First Sister Lake. Um, so, you know, that prohibition zone was to keep anybody from using the water here um, from a well. Uh, if that happened over here, we would have to have a lot of REUs all of a sudden. Anyways, so here's the uh, KFC site. Um, again, these are just screenshots. And there's the 3D view of the plumes to give you a better idea of the volume of dioxane that still remains to be taken out. Uh, these are the 1995 database that uh, not all of these are in the current database. These are the non-detects prior to 1995. These are the detections prior to 1995. Again, a lot, a lot of these data points are not in the uh, either Gelman's or Eagle's official database. I have them because I asked for them back in the day. You know, when I first got involved, I said, where's the data? And it took a, a year or two, but I got it. And a lot of this data is actually state data for the, the homeowners in uh, homeowner wells here in Evergreen, for instance. These are all the positive hits of existing monitoring wells over the years. Now, what I want to point out here is there's some of these 1995 data points where my cursor is, for instance, uh, where there's gaps in the data. And gaps in the data that concern us because it's close, closer to the Knights of Columbus property. Excuse me, I hate to be out of order, but is this a presentation on the Gelman Bloom or the Knights of Columbus project? Well, it's, it's the Gelman Bloom because, because that is. is I would like a copy of the presentation, please. Well, I, I, I'm making a video of it so you can. It will be available. It's, it's available. being recorded, so you'll be able to yeah. have it. And I also have, um, I also have all the slides queued up, so you know, send me a request. We have requested from the township. Okay, uh, these are all the monitoring wells, the uh, current monitoring wells. Well, I can't say current because some of these aren't being used anymore, but this is the list of all the monitoring wells. <clears throat> now we're getting into some of the flow studies that have been done. This one happens to be done by Larry Lemke and one of his students, showing some of the ways that uh, dioxin could move from the Gelman site in different directions based on uh, you know, some assumptions. We have to use a lot of assumptions because there's not a lot of good data. Here's one that's heading right straight for the KFC site. And this, this one kind of goes more toward the west. But this is the one that could be a big concern and it might actually uh, point to what is actually happening because as you'll see in the future images here, 
we have some hits in this area on a homeowner well that no one expected. So we zoom in a little bit on this. Again, these are the hits from 1995. Uh, even in 1995, there wasn't a lot of sampling in certain areas here. There's some areas that are not well covered. Again, the current uh, or historical official uh, sampling. Uh, these yellow squares pretty much are the uh, areas that uh, Eagle has been sampling with the county uh, on homeowner wells every year or two around the peripheral of the plume. But of course, their sampling method isn't as, as uh, detailed as the one that EPA recommends and that SIO used for their sampling. You'll see those in a minute. So here's the sampling uh, results that SIO did um, using the 522 method. It can detect down to 0.12 parts per billion. Uh, most of these are in deeper uh, aquifer heading straight north from the site. Um, anybody who's been studying this it should be very surprised by this because the state was doing sampling of homeowner wells in here and did not detect this. This was all new stuff within the last three years. And this one over Roger, here. Oh, this is Jan. Could you just briefly go through the um, the state um, limit and the EPA limit, just so people understand when you're saying I have so a, much to detect? I have a slide, yeah. I have okay, a slide coming up for that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this is the uh, property right next door to the KFC site that had uh, two hits that were above, uh, I think they were like 0 0.8, 0 0.9 uh, parts per billion. So this one would be detected by the state's new analysis method. Uh, their old analysis method, they tweaked it so it supposedly can get down to 0 0.5 parts per billion. But it's not as, it's, it's not as uh, accurate as the 522 method that can detect down to 0 0.12. Uh, so the state's going to go out and do sampling of the sites that SIO had, uh, and, and this is only 25 with the hits, so there's another 100 of them that are around the area. Um, but of the hits, using the state's new uh, tweaked uh, old method, they're going to miss 40% of the hits. So we're not going to have any better information about where the low levels of dioxane are in Sio Township. Uh, when the EPA comes in, they said they're going to use 522 method and they will find, you know, where the dioxane really is. And that's what we've been missing all these years. So again, superimposed under this is, you know, some of the analysis of flows, potential flows. Here's another uh, uh, overlaid uh, image with some of the supposed flows of how dioxin got to different places. And of course, Barton Pond's up here. And so even if you have water, <laughs> uh, you know, having city water is not going to necessarily solve the problem if we don't stop this dioxin. And, you know, taking all the dioxin out solves a lot of problems. Letting it go creates a lot of future problems. Um, by the way, the uh, the well that got hit here, uh, right next to the KFC property, that is not a deep well. That's an intermediate well. It's only uh, eighty two feet deep. Um, and the static water level is, you know, pretty high in that area. So, uh, let's see, here's uh, some of the data that uh, I'm trying to pull together um, for the wells to the north here. These all tend to be deeper wells. There's a few of these we don't have well data for. 
Uh, so I've been trying to find sources for that well data. It's not it, not all the data is in well logic, and and I think next time anybody goes out and samples from homeowner wells, they should ask the homeowners, "Do you happen to have a well log?" You know, especially if we don't have it in the well logic system, ask, "Do you have a well log?" Because that's what happened to my property. I'm up here at Corner Wagner, and um, my well log is not in the well logic system. Mine, fortunately, does not detect so far, but it's at the same elevation, screened elevation, as these guys. So I'm concerned about this dioxin making its way up here. I'm especially concerned now that I saw where the water district is because the water district's not going to include me. I'm west of Wagner. <laughs> not that I want to have city water because that's a, a big expense. I'd rather have the dioxin gone. And here's the well on the KFC site. This is the well log I could find in some of your documentation that was presented. So it's 162 feet deep. But the thing that caught my eye was all the clay layers. And this must be in the area that can't perk very well. Um, so to to say that, you know, you can use uh, uh, the standard uh, one acre parcel. Well, if you try to put a well hey, Roger, in that let's one. Let's keep to the data, there. please. I'm sorry. Can you just keep to the raw data and that conclusions, please? Okay. Thank you. And I think uh, the other thing I have here. Oh, yeah. So here's the uh, all the cross sections that uh, Gelman has done over the years, and you'll notice that none of these cross sections uh, overlap with the KFC site because that was thought to be not a problem. But now that we have a hit next door, yeah, we should have cross sections for that area. Similarly, uh, outside people have done cross sections. Uh, a couple of these are actually in the materials you have, uh, but they end here before it trans, uh, transecting the, uh, the KFC site. So we really don't know what the aquifers look like in this area. We don't have enough monitoring wells doing enough tests and, there's, and nobody has done the analysis. Um, here's the state's uh, version of their uh, Rockworks map overlaid on the Gelman maps and it matches up pretty well uh, except there are several areas where they don't have enough data and so their their modeling is discontinuous and I put circles around those areas that are discontinuous. And one of those areas is back here where I've been pointing out there's not enough data. Um, so we don't know what's going on here in this area. Uh, the Rockworks model was lacking data, so they had to admit, show it discontinuous. Uh, the state's trying to get some additional wells put in as part of the fourth CJ settlement in this location here. But even at that location, for some reason, the state's not required them to drill to bedrock like they have with all of, uh, we thought they were gonna supposed to do that with all new wells, uh, all new government monitoring wells. Um, and for some reason they skipped that one. Like maybe some of it is, I don't know why, I'm not gonna speculate, but. One minute, Roger. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, so that's just another view of it. And again, this is the area you know, where there's missing data and we really don't know. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns and it's terrible to have decisions made without unknowns. These are the, the uh, areas, supposedly uh, areas of uh, groundwater uh, recharge areas. And uh, I think that's about it. Oh, and then I have the, the maps that showed the uh where the 2012 where the water district sewer district and the sanitary sewer the real concern i have with um bringing outside water into an area like this is what's going to happen if you do that for all the other areas that are going to get hooked up to city water without city sewer what happens to that water i want somebody to answer the question over over the decades what's going to happen to that water because I already had uh, 15 20 feet of bank lost 
in my backyard because of Honey Creek. Yeah, this is Honey Creek behind me right now in my, my image here, my, my video. Uh, when, it, when you get an inch of rain, inch and a half of rain, this is what happens to the creek behind my house. Same spot. So it goes from six or eight inches to four feet deep, moving about 15 miles. We, we can't see that. Well, that's just because. That's the yeah, app. Yeah, before, before. Yeah. Well, that's right, because I'm not on regular Zoom. Let me. Uh, because you I, have didn't, a... I didn't close my window. There we go. Sorry. Okay, Roger, do you want to wrap my... up, please? Thank you. So this is the water that we're going to have to deal with in the future. Okay. Thank you, Rod. Thank you. We appreciate all the work that you're doing on this. With that, questions? Questions for Roger? <laughs> all right, then we'll move on um, and open up. Um, public comment. Uh, people wishing to address the Planning Commission on matters which are not on the public hearing, which is the uh, best friend's pet care, um, uh, or seek information on any other matters. Um, oral presentation shall be limited to three minutes, except a representative or a spokesperson of an organization shall have five minutes. And with that, I'm opening public comment up at 757. Is there anyone present who would like to make public comment? All right. Anyone online? Let's start with Margaret Engel. Ms. Engel, you have the floor. Good evening. Uh, I'm asking uh, I'm asking you to recommend denial of the Knights of Columbus PUD for the following reasons. The proposed type and density of the PUD will result in an unreasonable burden on the roads and public health and safety because of the positioning between two hilly curves on one of the township's main roads. Also, the proposed type and density will result in an unreasonable burden on the township's public utilities. The determination of where and when water is piped to a certain area should not be dictated by a single development. Piping water here to benefit one private company will have major implications for all SIO residents and taxpayers. Who will bear the cost of upkeep and repair for a water line under I-94 in the future? Approval could also set a very bad precedent for development elsewhere in the township and hamstring the township's ability to control where future developments take place. And looking at that presentation tonight, anything south of that Miller line that's in the water service area is much more vulnerable to uncontrolled development than because you're setting a bad precedent here. And, and given the concerns about public health, safety, and welfare of the township, it would be unconscionable to approve without a thorough hydrogeologic study. Professor Lemke's letter of June 9th states that the results of a study could allay fears, or the results could cause the concerns to be amplified. The study was a requirement of the Planning Commission, and Norfolk has had a year and a half to fulfill that requirement. They did not. In essence, Professor Lemke and Roger Rail just now suggest that, hey, it really is possible that the Gelman plume could be a problem at this site. The problem is now, at this moment, when you vote, we don't know. We don't know a lot at this delicate moment. We don't know about the consent judgments and the EPA Superfund. Ohio should not go forward with this. The proposal is also not consistent with SIO's master plan goals, which are stated as throughout the master plan, we say we want to keep higher density development within the area already served by sewer and water and other critical infrastructure not present at that site. 
The master plan repeatedly states the goal of retaining SIO's rural character. This will not do then. The master plan's PUD environmental objectives would be undercut by the fact that we'll be building in a designated bioreserve. And with no public transportation, the development would add to not diminish vehicular trips. The master plan's land use goal number one is that land use should be consistent with the community's desires. Clearly, this development is not. Dozens of people have written and spoken out against this proposal. Has anyone spoken out in favor of it? Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Next. We have James E. Moore. Mr. E. Moore, you have the other floor. Unmuted. Jim? It's James. My name is James D. Moore. We could come back. We could come back. We come back. <coughs> um, let's move on to Kathleen Brandt. Uh, Ms. Brandt, you have the floor. Uh, good evening. This is Kathleen Brandt, a SIO resident, taxpayer, and advocate for the environment. Um, I would like to thank Margaret Engel for her, her continued, thoughtful, researched, well-reasoned presentations on this particular site. That uh, Her insights are invaluable. I would like to thank OHM for their presentation tonight because it clearly points out a flaw in this plan, which I will address. I would like to note that the Norfolk Homes hydrology plan does not address the Gelman plume whatsoever. It addresses water hydrology movement into the aquifer, 12,000 gallons per day into the aquifer that is below that property. It has no mention of the flow of the Gelman plume and the impacts of drilling under I-94 and how that potentially impacts the movement of the Gelman plume. Please review that document very closely because it is sorely lacking in an adequate hydrology report. Now, I, I do want to talk about OHM's presentation. I would like you to refer to page eight. This is a critical document for your decision. If you look at page eight, it clearly shows a 20-year plan for extending the water in a northern loop, which, by the way, I've never heard that mentioned at a board of, of trustees me meeting, but it clearly shows access of water up through Elizabeth Road and then down Wagner. It does not show a path that Norfolk is suggesting. So this is exactly a situation where we have a master plan for water and I please, please follow the master plan instead of changing a plan for a developer. You, can't, you cannot reconcile this to the master plan. We did not plan to put water under I-94 to solely uh, service the KFC property. So therefore you should deny. Um, I advocate for denying. Um, all the environmental reasons, um, any property north of the KFC property, uh, they are influenced by the discharge of the waste treatment system of 12,000 gallons a day. So you are, if you 
approve this, you are potentially putting all of those properties at risk for moving, migrating the Gelman plume into their property, therefore focusing on forcing them to go in water from Ann Arbor, which eventually the plume is getting to Barton Pond is gonna be in that water. So this- Thank not, you, Kathleen, we need you to wrap up. Please. I'm not quite done, Jan. I wanna speak specifically to your behavior response to Roger Rail, which I thought was totally inappropriate to cut him off. And Kathleen, he I'm gonna give you another warning. Concern. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. Next. Next is uh, Jonathan, no last name. Jonathan, you have the floor. Hey, so I'm going to say something that I haven't heard anyone say yet tonight. That is, I'll be brief. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember who the first speaker's name was, uh, but she had mentioned that um, we don't want to set precedent. And I agree with her. Uh, we need to stick to the rules, not make special ones for companies that have lots of money. But unfortunately, a precedent has been set. It's been set when during a BOT meeting, Will called a developer to let him know about something that was going to be done and save some money at taxpayers' expense. We have a 30 year contractor, Doug, here, who gives unfettered access to developers, tells residents that residents that they can't develop their land because they're just not um, going to let them. You got to have to have a lot of money coming in here if you want to develop your land. Um, and uh, he made changes to the master plan that weren't asked for. Um, and yet he has time to do all that. But for the last month, I've been trying to get garbage picked up off my lawn that for whatever reason, he's in charge of enforcement as well. It's been about eight, nine emails. Mark Brazo has already said this is like two weeks ago. This is ridiculous. Either, either enforce the rules <laughs> or, or don't. But this is just nuts. And now it's gone on for another two weeks. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, uh, for all the reasons stated, including the fact that it doesn't adhere to the master plan, we would be setting precedents that will hurt ourselves down the road, the Gilmans, the ecological issues, um, all of that. You got to vote no. There's no choice on this one. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up is Pam Boyd. Ms. Boyd, you have this one. Thank you, Pam Boyd, a SIRE resident. The answer to vote no on this is actually very simple. As representatives, you planning commissioners um, have SIRE residents' um, health and well being in the palm of your hands. If this property, if this, if this goes through, um, as the developer wishes, and then uh, the Gelman plume spreads to neighboring wells, it'll be on you all. It'll be your fault. It'll be your fault. Please vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Rita Clinthorne. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Um, you know, I just, I don't want to have a lot to say, but I, I, I think that we should not move forward with this. I, I feel like um, there are just so many flags on the field for one thing. Uh, if, if I could just echo everything Margaret um, uh, said earlier, and also, uh, you know, I, I, I think that we really need to pay attention to what Roger Rail is saying. I do feel like he was rushed and, and uh, cut off at times. Um, I just think that it's important that the township really know what they're doing before they give a green flag to this because it is setting a precedent saying, well, we, we want this and this and this from the developer, but we'll settle for a whole lot less. 
And I think that that is a dangerous path to go down. Um, I don't think, especially if this site is, is just has so many flags on the field that this is something you really have to pay attention to in 10 years and 15 years, if you let this go forward, um, how do you how do you wind this back into the box? How do you say, oh darn, we shouldn't have gone, we shouldn't have done that? When we can just wait 10 more minutes, let's at least make the developer do the things that you ask them to do. And they want to build more um, homes on this area, the KFC pro uh, property than the township would like for them to do. And somehow that is just getting sliding over the line more and more so easily all the time. Um, I think we need to pay attention to these things. These are things that you asked for and I think you should pay attention to them. So that's all I really want to say. Thanks for your time and thanks for what you're doing. Thank you. Okay, next up is Ryan Gapel. Mr. Gapel, you have the Thanks, Doug. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, just one quick thing here. I'd like to echo on to everyone that's complimented Margaret Engel on all of her points. I think they're very crucial, very important to this particular development. One of the things that, that comes to mind that nobody else has mentioned quite yet is Doug has done a number of reviews on this particular project. The most recent one that was in the packet included this evening was from April the 24th, 2023, specifically on page seven. Um, and this is something that's come up in almost every review that Doug does, uh, is in relation to the underlying zoning, the proposed type and density of use shall not result in a material increase in the need for public services, facilities, and utilities. In this particular case, the developer, even if they're contributing towards it, is requiring water access, and it's not a simple tap from the side of the road. It's requiring a massive undertaking of boring a pipe underneath an interstate freeway. This is something to be seriously contemplated, and, and I don't think it meets this criteria. I think you guys really should consider this carefully because ultimately, I don't think this is in the spirit of the master plan, which is also talked about in the defining points for a PUD. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, next up is Rob Pattinson. Mr. Pattinson, you have the floor. Oh, hold on, I got it. That you. There you go, sorry. Now you. Rob Pattinson, SIO resident. For the past year and a half, you have heard many reasons why this is uh, an inappropriate project for this site. I won't repeat any of those. You've heard some very good points earlier tonight. 60 years ago, Gelman started poisoning our groundwater. 40 years ago, he got caught. And for a developer to come into SIO Township and refuse for a year and a half to do a hydrogeological study to find how their project will impact the Gelman plume shows a colossal lack of insight and thoughtfulness. That alone should raise major red flags with this particular developer. And then tonight during Roger Rail's presentation, there's an outburst from the developer asking for this data and for them to come into this meeting just tonight and not be aware of the dioxane data and card and people like Roger Rail and the data he has after a year and a half, again, should be a major red flag for this committee. Please vote no on this project. This project is fraught with problems and it's your duty to protect Sio Township from these types of developers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple more. Uh, James D. Moore is back with us. So, James, do you have a question? All right, can you hear me now? I'm going to start talking. I assume that you hear me. 
This is James Damore, and I spoke previously before you at your last meeting regarding the KOC site. Um, I'm going to remind everybody once again that I speak to you as a fellow uh, uh, former planning commissioner with the city of Ann Arbor. I'm also a member of CARD um, with Citizens Action Remediation Dioxane, which is formed larger in response to uh, an adequate response to the Gelman plume. Though I'm a member, my marks are solely my own. I want to thank the commission for last month's meeting. I share much of your feedback related to the project. All of you raised some very good and valid points and concerns. I wish uh, the city of Ann Arbor could demonstrate as much due diligence and thoughtfulness as you've done with respect to planning issues as you direct growth challenges. Thank you for your service. Given that, um, I don't have too much in the way of an additional public commentary, although I think I echo what the previous speaker just said. Um, as I understand last month's meeting, there was an issue regarding distribution of documents. Tom Covert remarked about the unusual nature of this issue, something he hadn't observed in his 27 years of service in the industry. Um, as I mentioned, I was a member of the Planning Commission with Ann Arbor. I'm familiar with Mr. Heisler and his several decades of experience as a builder. Norfolk Builders has been acquiring developing land in much of Western Washtenaw County for some number of years now. Given the vast experience of the institution, individual experience of the petitioners, now this leaped out at me. Given their long time standing in the community, surely, surely they will understand the importance of listening to the township request for a hydrogeological study, given the very nature of the Gelman plume. If they had certainly wished the project move forward, they would have ceded to the township's wishes. And given also that they're requesting the township permit them access to city water from access points to the south across 94, that's an indication to me they understand that, that the plume issues out there. Working in good faith with the community and working to include, ensure the public safety, health, and welfare of the community and minimum disturbance of natural features requires being fair to the host community. I really didn't see that at the last meeting. And uh, given that the hydrological study was a standing request for some time, this raises questions for me. It should for you as well. Given the outstanding concerns you noted regarding water connection and disturbance of natural features and impacts to the aquifer of a private sewer system, your choice is clear. I recommend denial of the project in consequence of these concerns. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <coughs> So that hand is uh, Marty Mayo. So Ms. Mayo, you have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Marty Mayo, I'm a Sao resident. Uh, I have just a question. Uh, I noticed that I read the uh, reread the parallel plan by which um, it, you determined that the, the, the possibility of building 47 units. I don't know whether that parallel plan was um, how they handled the sewer and the water. The parallel plan really just dealt with the issue of can you squeeze in the houses in the, in the property. But I didn't see how, if, whether the parallel plan uh, presupposed that water service and sewer service would be available or not. It just was, that was not mentioned as part of the parallel plan. I think it should be whether if the, if that is not possible, if the parallel plan does not include water and sewer, uh, it's rather um, not appropriate. And I urge you to consider that. And I urge you in lieu of what we've just been hearing, I urge you to think very seriously about approving this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this point, there are no additional hands up. Okay. 
right. Then, uh, one more. No. Okay. False. I'll entertain a motion to close public comment. So moved. Moved by Commissioner Moore and supported by Commissioner Burke. Yeah. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And uh, just note for the record that John Reiser stepped out for a moment and did not vote. All right. Um, public comment is closed at 8.21. We'll move on to public hearings. Uh, we did um, postpone and extend the public hearing for uh, Best Friends Pet Care uh, commercial uh, kennel. Um, and uh, we did not have a representative. Um, we do have a representative yes. now. So if you'd like to come forward yeah. and um, present your your project. Sure. And I, typically with the, um, the public hearings, we have the applicant uh, present their project um, and hear the reviews and then continue any questions or comments that um, the public will have. Oh, Mr. Anderson. You, you can sit and you should, there should be a sign-in sheet specifically yeah, I, for yours. I did. Okay, great. Then, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome to sit. Mm -hmm. great, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Keith Murrell. I'm uh, the VP of Construction for Best Friends Pet Care. Uh, tell you a little bit about ourselves, and I'll be brief because I know it's late already. Uh, we uh, operate 41 uh, centers in 17 states. We, uh, our flagship store, our center is uh, in Disney World. We're operating partner of Disney. We have 11 centers in Walmarts. Uh, we have two that are going to be in construction in other Myers in two weeks, and we're looking to get a conditional use permit for the Jackson Road facility up here. Uh, it will be grooming and doggy daycare in an existing space, which was a former bank, 731 square feet approximately. Um, I know that they've uh, our team has sent over, answered all the additional questions that that's been back and forth. That hopefully you've seen all that. Um, questions were, you know, hours of operation, seven days a week, eight to six, how many employees, typically we'd have eight total, but at any one time, there'd be three to four, which would consist of a groomer, uh, two doggy daycare uh, team members, and possibly a, a, a bather. Uh, and that's really the extent of our operation in regards to, you know, finishes. I know that was one of the questions, what do we do to, to keep the place clean or sanitized? You know, we use our floors are all welded, seamed. You know, like I said, we're in 41, 41 locations. We, we know what we're doing. Uh, in, in the bathing facility, it's all tiled, <coughs> tiled cove. Uh, we use um, Rescue. It's a hydrogen peroxide cleaner, which is in sanitizer, which is used in 95% of the of veterinary facilities across the country. It's really, when it breaks down, it's water and oxygen. <coughs> Safe for a dog to drink. If in turn, they were to drink it. Um, and that's really it. Uh, we're going to go into an existing space and we're looking for a conditional use permit for that. Yeah, I think um, prior we had uh, some questions about um, there was a mention of um, before dogs come in, oftentimes they need to relieve themselves. Yes. And could you, it, it wasn't really explained so, exactly what. That so, is. in regards to that, <coughs> we have a pest, a pest, a pet. Uh, relief station that you know we'll find a location for it's in our uh, master lease agreement with Myers to install them at every one of their facilities and and this facility it typically would be out in one of the green spaces has bags and a sign and, and basically there's a, a waste container on the bottom just like you'd see in a park or, a, or like a doggy park is the entrance to the facility to the store from the outside from the outside yeah there are no dogs are allowed in the store There'd be a glass. To, um, I'm not sure if this location has a, a vet IQ or any other businesses, but there'd be a glass door in the front with our signage, and you'd enter from the outside. No dog would go into the center. Check. You're referring to Jackson Road, right? Yes, sir. So Jackson Road has one other business there, which is I think a hair salon for kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, as a matter of fact, we're right next door to that. Where we had a bank before. A bank, exactly. So the entrance would be from the outside. That bank never had any entrance from the outside. No. So that's going to be carved. Yes. The There's three sets of glass doors, glass windows there now that have blueberries on them. Yes. And that would be where the door would go. That's mm -hmm. uh, in regards to, I mean, I don't know how, how granular you want to get, but our use requires that all the air inside that building is exhausted. So nothing's recirculated. Um, you know, 
So once again, everything that we use is gets exhausted. And how in the lease, how large of the open green space area is the pet relief station? It's well, it, it's it really it's just a, it's a piece of it's a pedestal with a sign, uh, a, a, a basket for the actual bag, and then a plastic bag dispenser. Okay, but it has to be placed in some place. Yes, typically, separate. right. We'd find, a, I think, the, the way the lease reads a mutually agreed upon location because it's a master lease for multiple locations. Oh, so the, okay, I was just trying to picture this. So um, to enter your, uh, where you would want to be in here is going through the front door. Uh, no, it would be to the right. If I don't know if you're familiar with that center there. I'm familiar with and, Meyer. Yeah, so there's two main entrances. We're to the left. There's a main entrance to the left. There's a section where they put their carts in. And then there's another section, and that's where we would be going, where the former bank was. So between the two entrances. Exactly. Right. So you go into the front entrance of the store to no, get the, no. no, you're going to have your own entrance right. in front. Next to the front. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But we don't. There's no dogs in my. And then the relief station. It's a very uh, interesting crafted term. That's just going somewhere in the green area. Correct. Somebody's bagging it up and bringing it to your relief station to throw it away. Right. Uh, it's bagged and thrown away. Correct. Okay. Like I said, if you've been to like a, a doggy park. Yeah. It, it's exactly what it is. Have you looked on the site to determine where that might be? I mean, I've, I'm trying to find the green area. I have not. It's all parking lot out there. There are a few pretty green. There are a few green areas. Area. So the green area either would be on the right hand side where we have Panera and everything else, Starbucks, maybe some green area there. There's a green area right across the parking lot, but that's a long walk. Mm -hmm. Be near the spectacle shop, AT&T store, but that's like 100 miles away, literally. Uh, Walking through the cars and everything else. Which when you is, say green area, you mean a small? I mean, it's someplace where there's typically plantings, like in other words. Okay. So, and well, the other one would be on the left, you would walk across the entire store near the charging station, near the right bus stop, et cetera, et cetera. That's also like many, many miles away, a lot of far away. So the question is, where is the green area that would be suitable? Well, like I said, I, I can't answer. Like I, guess yeah, I can't yeah. answer that no, today. No, I'm not asking, yeah, answered, but. Okay. but I mean, I could certainly we could come up with. I'd have to get Myers approval exactly where it would go. But every one of our locations within Myers will have one. There isn't one nearby. Yeah, there really isn't. Yeah, the only nearest one is near the Starbucks and all that places. If there's one existing, but I haven't checked lately. Or an outlier. The outlet is far away, like I said. I know. This is like very far away. You would walk through the cars and everything. Anyway. Okay, I think we've identified. Yeah. 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 We've identified okay. Kim, did you have another? Uh, just so uh, your daycare, would that be overnight daycare? No, we, we do no. There's, yeah. There's no, no snowboarding. And, and do the dogs go out at all during the time that they're under doggy daycare? No, no. There's floor drains. Uh, we pat, we uh, pick up the, the waste, you bag it. Uh, the floors are sanitized after each session with that rescue product that's washed down. There's hose reels in there. The franchise? Yeah, well, we're, we're, we're private. Yeah, but we have 41. And we're operating 10 of these right now, the exact same concept in Walmart with nine, we're 90 more to build. <coughs> Any more questions of, of back? Uh, how many? Dogs per day, do you have, how many dogs at a time will be in the facility? Typically, in a, in a busy grooming salon, we would see anywhere from, and these are small salons, you know, eight to 10 dogs a day. In a doggy daycare, we have like three or four at each side, which would be small dog and large dog, it's separated by size. So the dogs will be in there together with their food? Uh, no, you would drop your dog off. You know, like you wouldn't come and play with your dog. You'd drop your dog off if you shopped. A lot of people drop their dog off, say they, they're young professionals or professionals who work all day and they don't want to have their dog alone all day. They'll drop them off. They'll drop them off for socialization. If so you've got a new dog and you want to socialize your dog. So the daycare is how many dogs? It all depends on the size of the dog and the breed of the dog in the day. But typically on the small dog side, we have three or four. On the big dog side, it'd be exactly the same. That's at any one time. That could be if you drop your dog off while you shopped, if you dropped your dog off, you know, for the day, all that's. It would be three to four, small or big. 
on, on each side. So there's a small dog side and a big dog side, separated oh, by two areas. Right. Play areas, you call it. Exactly. And as like I said, rubberized floors are all welded seam. There's hose reels that, you know, they get washed, the floors gets washed down and such and such. Can you show them why it has this franchise? Uh, right now we're in uh, Worcester, Ohio, in Elkhart, Indiana. Oh, okay, nothing. No, no. And, and quite frankly, you know, we're, we don't have, uh, we have two stores in Michigan on our full size things. You know, most of our growth, quite frankly, is in the South, but Myers came to us and we love Myers. I mean, what a great chain, right? Um, you know how they operate. They wouldn't come to us if they didn't believe in our, our operation. So they wanted to have one in Michigan and it was a matter of what real estate was available at the time. We went through your review. Yeah, did did yeah. you want to just maybe just update, update anything based on yeah, their I responses? Mean, our, um, I think we're good with, uh, we have three conditions. One was provide a project narrative talking about hours of operation, numbers of employees, um, area of tenant space. I think those are all clear now. The um, applicant did provide the required information for conditional use, as we mentioned, section 36 220. Um, however, one of our conditions was to provide a waste disposal plan. Outlined sanit sanitation practices associated with the groom and dog daycare use. So the applicant has verbally indicated what that is, but uh, I'm looking at her, the top photograph right now of Myers, and I, I agree with what has been said. I don't really see a green space um, other than the other than the parking lot landscape island, um, which are going to be between cars and and it seemed to me it'd be very inconvenient to take a dog. So um, I think that's that one item. The rest of the items, I mean, this is a relatively small operation. I don't, we don't see any impacts with traffic or parking. Myers obviously has a lot of parking. Um, don't see this impacting, you know, the RUs of the township or anything like that. But it's really, you know, just a function of how this is going to work. Um, and uh, again, the applicant has verbally indicated how this is going to work, but I'm still not quite understanding myself. So uh, I think that condition is still out there. Thank you. Then uh, we'll be uh, then moved to anyone present who would like to address the Planning Commission uh, regarding the, um, our, the pet care conditional use. Anyone online? Uh, there is one hand up online. It is uh, two hands up. Uh, we have Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. A couple of questions that I'd have to ask is uh, number one, um, effectively, and hat tip to Ryan here, but uh, how many REUs worth of, of poop are you going to be generating per day? In other words, if you're going to uh, have a business that uh, that uh, generates dog waste during the day. How are you going to dispose of that? And the whole green space thing, you know, forget about that. That's not going to happen any unless Meyer's willing to dig up some sidewalk for you and put down some green plastic grass. I mean, that ain't going to happen out there. So you should really go take a walk around Meyer's. Um, but uh, to the applicant. Um, Anyone, do you, uh, do you, I just want to ask you, do you have a dog <clears throat> yourself, sir? Uh, I had a dog. Our dog passed away several years ago. I'm sorry to hear that. Sorry. Um, but anyone that says dogs uh, can clean, can drink former cleaning chemicals probably shouldn't have a dog. That was a really amazing statement you made earlier that, that this stuff breaks, these cleaning chemicals break down and dogs can actually drink it. Um, I don't recommend that to anybody who's listening. I would also be very curious to hear from you how, how you plan to remove the waste from the green area and how you plan to manage waste along dog waste along the sidewalk 
or in the parking lot on the way to your shop. Not all dog owners are, as we know very well from next door, not all dog owners are uh, well, uh, they don't take care of their dog's waste. And so if a dog lets loose in front of Myers on the way in, who's going to take care of that? Just some practical things that I would want to know before I go to Myers with your store encased in it. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Yeppel, Mr. Yeppel, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Lawad. Uh, good evening to the applicant. Uh, thank you for coming to Sayo Township. Uh, happy to have you. Uh, a couple of sort of follow-up questions and points. I guess from the sounds of it, it sounds like either you guys are going to cut into that masonry base wall and have an external entrance into Meyer, um, just making sure people are aware of not bringing their pets into Meyer. I don't know if you guys have like a messaging system when people make appointments or come to see you. Um, just because I know Meyer can be a little militant about that at times, depending on who's working there. Um, another sort of question or comment, um, obviously sort of what uh, Jonathan just said would probably make the most sense if you can get Meyer to agree to do, uh, or to allow you rather to dig up some of the concrete they have quite a bit right in front of the store there especially on that close to that out lot or I guess in lot in line space that you're going to be taking up I think that would be uh, an awesome feature if you guys could have that built into the ground instead of raised up above um, ultimately I, I think your business makes a lot of sense the logo was a little bit confusing because it said hotel so that made me think there's some sort of overnight component to your business at first but uh, now that you've been able to come here and clarify that, uh, so I took care of that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up is Pam Boyd. Thank you. Pam Boyd, a Sire resident. Meyer is my favorite grocery store, and I go there fairly frequently. Um, Every now and then, um, I need to go to the PetSmart over off of Ann Arbor Saline Road. And if you look at the picture of the front of PetSmart, I just I just pulled it up. Um, they have a, um, a a pet waste station, and that's usually where the pet urinates or defecates. It's 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 all concrete or rock. And um, when I have walked by there before or going from the parking lot, um, it's kind of nasty. I, I'm not against having um, this pet center there. I, I think that it needs to be well thought out in, in the dog outdoor space because dogs are gonna dog um, and, and that's, just, that's just how nature works. And I get that. But I also don't want to walk because you're real close there to uh, the east entrance. Um, and I don't particularly want to walk um, through anything. Um, so that's, that's a concern. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, this is Kathleen Brandt, still a SIO resident. And by the way, I'm a dog owner. Uh, we have a doodle. That means her hair doesn't stop growing. So we go to a groomer every six to eight weeks. Um, honestly, I would not take my dog to a groomer at, at Myers. And that's because of this, the uh, expansive pavement there. Um, we take our dog to a very small facility. Usually when she's done, as most dogs, they need to relieve themselves. So I think this would impact my uh, decision to actually shop at Myers. I wouldn't use your um, business for grooming because I don't wanna park way out in the parking lot because there's so many cars. Walk my dog 100, feet yards 
into Myers and then do the same thing on the return. So I have a question for you. You made a statement that Meyer sought you out to put your business into that store into their stores. Is that true or did you seek out Myers to try to make that as an avenue to expand your business? I, and I, I didn't see Myers saying, you know, let's bring in dog grooming right next to our produce or cashiers. So could you answer that? Did they really seek you out? I, yeah, we'll keep it between, yeah. No, nope. Jan, public comment is supposed to allow questions and answers from the petitioner. So I'm gonna ask that you please honor that. You just- yeah, we, We'll be glad to ask that, Kathleen. You okay. just allowed it for Jonathan Greenberg, Jan, but you won't allow it for me? Okay, hang on. All right, I'm not done, Jan, I'm not done. All right. Please, you cut me off last time. Okay, so now let's uh, pivot to the report from uh, Carla Wartman. On page two of their report, they state that dog grooming is not a listed use in the zoning ordinance. However, commercial kennels would be the most similar use as listed as a conditional use in the C2 zoning district. Then on page, let me get there, page five, it states that the requirement is five acres for a commercial kennel and this meets the requirements. How does five acres of asphalt meet the requirements for a commercial kennel? Because a commercial kennel is going to need green space. So I don't, I challenge, I don't agree with uh, Carlisle Walkman's assessment. Please take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. You fucking tried to call me off again. Oh, did, was that all? <laughs> <laughs> well, next up is uh, Pat Stein. Um, Pat, uh, you have the floor. Good evening. So um, I, I read the application and I, I thought that I saw there were going to be no changes to the exterior of the building, yet yeah, you're talking about cutting through concrete to making a door a window, I mean, a window a door. So I'm, I'm really concerned with that. The other thing is um, Huntington Bank that was in that previous space, they had access through the store and there were a lot of glass panels and such. Is the doggy daycare and grooming station going to have the entrance that's inside the store that's gonna be sealed off completely and no one will be, using that either to leave or enter even after hours. I wanna ask that that would be something to consider to seal it off. The other thing is, how does the health department feel about the possibility of dog excrement getting into the store? I'm talking people's shoes as they walk through the parking lot, uh, cart, cart wheels as you're gathering up all the carts and bringing them in the store. I am. Um, it doesn't sound very appealing to me to for groceries um, that you're going to cook and eat and, and doggy daycare. And is it doggy daycare or is it a grooming situation? Um, this, this doesn't appeal to me at all. I think the whole application stinks and I think it should be denied. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. That is, we have no other hands up in um, And I'll entertain a motion for, to close the public Move hearing. Close public hearing. Moved Support. by Commissioner Reiser and supported by Commissioner Moore. Uh, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and we're opposed at, 
845. So commissioners are people have a few more questions for the applicant or does he any have discussion? anything? There were some questions posed yeah. by callers that he might want to respond to. Mm -hmm. I'll respond to all sure. Okay. Yeah. So we are in, like I said, we're in 10 Walmarts and absolutely Myers did come to us. Matter of fact, they flew down to uh, Cibola, Texas and met us in that facility in a Walmart and walked it with us. And, uh, you know, the, the pet space is really important to their bills, their businesses. I don't know if you know that, you know, years ago, you go into a supermarket and it'd be, you know, half an aisle of pet food. You go into a, a grocery store today and there's multiple aisles of pet food. You know, Myers has a whole section in the back. And like I said, they came to us as understanding that, you know, this is the business that we do and asked that we could come into their, into their uh, facilities. So, like I said, we have two that are going to start within the next two weeks in Ohio and Indiana. And this one here would be our third. So, when it's my turn, I have questions. Yeah. You said you had some questions. Yeah, yeah. There, there may have been other questions. Um, answer, yeah. yeah, we talked about, you know, the, uh, the gentleman made a comment about, you know, the chemical that we use rescue. It's, it's hydrogen peroxide. It's diluted to 64 to 1 percentage. And really, the, when it breaks down, it's water and oxygen. But, you know, I'm not going to get into an argument with the gentleman. That's what the vets use, and that's what we use. So, so have you been to this site? Uh, yes, I've driven by it. Yes. Okay, let me give you a. This is my for my packet. And your site is top right or northeast. There's your site. Yes. And there's quote unquote green space, which we'll just call asphalt. Is there is there any like between like what is this? Those those are like little islands, and I think there's trees in those islands. So those islands. Am I being picked up? I don't know if I'm being picked up or not. And what I'm showing. Yeah, the aerial. That's in the packet. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wherever. <laughs> so, um, so <clears throat> the question I have, it's like the question people have is, how are we going to deal with waste? You're either going to have to park in the middle of the parking lot and have a dog relieve itself and then walk through traffic and backing up to get to the site or park way out there and use it there and walk there. So do you park, have your dog go to the bathroom, drive back there? So how do we deal with the waste? that a dog will avoid prior to going into or coming out of that appointment when it's really a concrete jungle right there. Yeah. In the Walmarts, this, they have this these islands, is that what you want to call them, refer to them, and that's where our pet waste stations are. In the islands? In the islands, right. In those where these, John, you talked about, where, uh, these are trees in there, I guess? Yeah, currently they're living. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's where they are. Okay. And Myers is going to be okay with dogs, you know, urinating and defecating in that space. And we're against, I mean, listen, I, I'm not opposed to this project, mm -hmm. but there's a real crucial aspect that we got to get right. And I don't know what the answer is. Um, and maybe Myers will work and maybe put a fence there and says dog use only, or they clear out some of the space around it like they do for shopping carts. But I don't know that we're there yet, but I'll defer to the to the others on this body as to what their thoughts are with how we deal with this important aspects uh, of this project, at least in my mind, is dealing with the uh, the urine and the feces that are invariably going to be created. Um, and I can imagine people just parking close to it like you want to do. There's a good spot. They let their dog out. And then the dog voids itself either in, in, in the uh, in the lane of travel or for a parking lot or or in a parking space or on the sidewalk and uh, you know. Go ahead. I think point made. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you, do you have another? I, I think a follow up to what John is saying, and I would say that I would like to see Meyer and the applicant work out the plan and then come tell us what they think the best plan is. And instead of us asking all these questions, let's have them tell us and then we evaluate the plan. Otherwise, and I'd like to see what the plan is in other Meyer stores. You know, if you say you're about to open, you've got a plan. They've approved a place. So what are they, what are they gonna approve and would we like to see that here? I, yeah, I think you've heard those concerns yeah. and I think we're, um, yeah, if you might have another, an additional question, go ahead. Nothing about relieving. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a relief. It's definitely been covered. Um, 
I was curious, I didn't think about this until one of the residents brought it up. The inside, inside the store, there's mm -hmm. an entrance into where your store will be, right? And are you planning on sealing that off? That, that door is, no, that door needs to stay because that door is used for all employees from us, the hair salon, the bank, none of them have actual bathrooms in any of those facilities. So they use the Myers bathrooms, but that door will, will not be used for anyone coming and that door will be locked. Oh, the door will be locked. Mm -hmm. So somebody left their dog for daycare while they shopped. Mm -hmm. They would go in off the parking lot right. and they go and pick their dog up. They would enter again off the parking Correct. lot. But none of those mezzanine spaces have, have restrooms. Except the dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plastic line. All right. I, anyone else? Um, I, I'm, I'm thinking that we sort of, I, I yeah. sense that we have enough of a concern about the plan that we'd like to um, postpone it and until that you can come with a, um, a, a proposal for um, place. Do you have an additional? Maybe just, this may be just summarizing what everybody's also said, but you know, my concerns really are just noise, you know, odor and waste. We discussed the waste portion, so I'm not gonna get into that. Is this insulated by any chance? That's a little more soundproof for the employees inside yeah, the so have... It sounds like you said you have exhaust that's Hundred percent odor. Yeah. So with the with in regards to odor, all our odor, all our air is exhausted. One hundred percent. Nothing gets recirculated back. You can't do it. You know, use use won't allow it. And in regards to sound, I said we're in ten of these in Walmart's. And believe me, they'd be the first one to complain. We insulate above the ceilings. Uh, all the wall the wall materials uh, are reflective, which is bad for us. Good for the outside. All the walls have been insulated as well. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Um, entertain a motion. Well, I would move to postpone this project for to our next monthly meeting. Well, I guess maybe not. I don't think it has to be date certain. It just until they can bring up. No, no, no. We do have to be date certain. Yeah, it's done. So we just have to until they come back with a plan. Yeah. Do I need to use this form motion? There's a second page has a table. All right. yeah. Okay, this you're using the word table. Yeah. yeah. So I would move to postpone the conditional land use uh, number CU23007, Best Friends Pet Care, Commercial Kennel. Um, to allow the applicant to respond to the comments discussed tonight by the Planning Commission, including the following. Um, what the plan would be established between uh, Best Friends Pet Care and Meyer for, for, the, I'll just, uh, for the relief station outside. May I amend that mm -hmm. to include, to also discuss how other Meyer stores have been resolved so that we can compare that to what this one would be. Or Walmart or, or Walmart. Wherever. Yep. So we can see examples of what's been done. Okay. And, okay, so really provide other location examples. <laughs> the only question I had was, I understand a postpone is to a date certain, and a table is where you lay it on the table, then you take it off the table when it's ready to come off the table. I don't know the time frame that this gentleman and his people need to get the, the plan and have a discussion with Meyer on how we can do this. Do you have any sense of that? I'm gonna meet the Meyer's people on Wednesday and Thursday. And both in Elkhart, Indiana, and in Worcester. So uh, we'll certainly get that ironed out by then. In the interim, I can get the information back on what we've done with the Walmarts and get the exact location for those as well. Not a problem. Was the next meeting? Oh, we don't have a project business at our last next meeting. So okay, it'll be the, the first one meeting? in July. 
No, I got that. I mean, that's plenty of time for me. Okay. So, for the current buyer, the proposal on Jackson Boulevard. And provide other location examples. Mm -hmm. What's the date of that meeting? I'm sorry. July 10th. And your friendly amendment was to bring other. Just provide other location examples. So we have something to compare this proposal with, with what has. Is in operation. I don't have a problem with that presentation. Okay. Is there support? Support. Support from Commissioner Riser. Any further discussion? Okay. Roll call vote, please. Okay. Commissioner High. Yes. Commissioner Sharma. Yes. Commissioner Riser. Yes. Commissioner Chan. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. And Commissioner Collins. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on to unfinished business, uh, Knights of Columbus, new PUD. Good evening. Did you have something you wanted to show uh, on the screen, or did you want to just go? Uh, I can. I do have a couple of new slides from the last time we met. Um, just as an update, so I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I think everybody was here the last time we did meet, except maybe Mr. Chang. Um, so if there's something, if you see a slide that you'd like me to talk about, I'm happy to do so. Um, I can see you. <laughs> Are you on your... I'm ra I've raised my hand. Oh, we're waiting for, there we go. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Commission. My name is Tom Colbert. I'm with Western Consulting. I'm here tonight with Jim Heisler and Sean LaFear from Norfolk Holmes and also Mark Sweatman from WSP. Uh, we're here tonight to talk about 3991 Dexter Ann Arbor Road, the preliminary PUD, which has been before you uh, a couple of times now. Uh, I think we're all familiar with where the site is, north of I-94, south of Dexter Ann Arbor Road. Um, and to the west of Zeeb Road. Sorry, Wagner Road. Uh, we've talked about how we've defined the project, that it's a, a clustered single family residential neighborhood with extensive open space uh, with active and passive rest, recreation. Uh, one of the uh, project elements is to restore the existing pavilion for social gathering, the gatherings of the folks that live in the neighborhood. And obviously the preservation of natural features in that open space area. Uh, I just want to reiterate that the project will be uh, served by the public water and a private community wastewater treatment solution. Um, one of the things at our last meeting that I expressed frustration over was the sharing of information and there were a number of documents that staff and consultants had shared and we had shared with our research that hadn't been distributed to everybody in here. So with this, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of things since our last meeting, you should all have received a, an email from the fire chief that not only talked about him receiving information about how we're going to residentially fire suppress the homes here, but also indicating the benefits to the fire authority for having water main or what the water main would bring to this. 
We also also have a memo from Dr. Lemke that's been provided. Again, the project proposed layout, 47 homes, paved private roads with walks, mowed pedestrian pathways, opportunity for a pathway along Dexter Ann Arbor Road. One of the things that was brought up at the last meeting was um, this notion for why we had selected this area for the five lots and the wastewater treatment plant. We had talked about the historical um, uses at the site. Um, if we look at the zoning map, this is our site here. Um, we're surrounded by properties that are in orange with MDOT. We have our neighbors to the west, our neighbors to the north, and our neighbor to the east. So we had cited those hots, those lots, and the wastewater treatment away from those borders, north, east, and west. Um, we also looked at aerial photography, which showed that area of the five lots. So this is 1979 photo. You can see the access drive off of Dexter Ann Arbor Road. The field is actually much larger in 1979. And that kind of continues uh, 1990 photograph, a couple other photographs here. 1998, you can see some trees have started to come back in this area. And then a 2010 aerial photograph where still some scrub shrub, but trees, but basically to show that we've, we've placed those, those lots in this area as opposed to this side because the trees just aren't as mature uh, as the trees that exist in the uh, western portion of the property. Just to highlight once again the open space that we have at our site it's about 33 acres it's the area in the turquoise shading here. Our project from a utility perspective uh, water main extension. So we're, we're proposing the extension of the water main from the Auto Mall Drive through the site. So we've come through Auto Mall Drive under 94 with a bore into the project area, around our project road, out to our entry, and then along our frontage on Dexter Ann Arbor Road with a 12 inch water main. So this is just a blow up of the development area. So again, our development, the homes would be located kind of focused on that plateau that sits on the site. A 12 inch water main is located here in yellow and across the front of the Dexter Ann Arbor Road. And then we would have an eight inch loop or lasso that you've heard it referred to that would serve the lots that, that front on the <coughs> internal private roadways. The wastewater treatment would be handled on site uh, for this preliminary PUD, we've shown this with a building um, that would be established where wastewater would be collected, treated, and then disposed of in a wastewater drain field or infiltration bed that would sit here to the west of that. Uh, it would have an access drive, and that access drive would have some parking for the operator when they came to visit the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, I will mention that the, the infiltration area is currently proposing of the fence, fences. And again, this, this spot on the site is one of the most distant directions we can get from the neighbors to the east and to the west. If you were to draw a line from this area to the northwest corner of the site, it'd be roughly 1,600 feet. The stormwater at the site is going to be collected and conveyed to three different basins. We have kind of a typical stormwater basin here, and then we have near our entry two uh, intro, uh, infiltration basins, which will be connected with a pipe. We had outstanding infiltration in this area of the site. So even though the infiltration exceeds um, the maximum requirements of the county, we've uh, completed this design to uh, only utilize the maximum extents from the county, but we have good infiltration there for our stormwater management. Our parallel plan, this is one of the things we talked about at the last meeting, there had been some revisions. So um, you may recall, uh, we had stub roads connecting to properties to the north and west. It was determined that maybe those properties had less likely um, opportunity to develop further since they're already zoned R2. Uh, so we removed those stub connections, replaced it with a cul-de-sac and a radius uh, here in the corner. And then the other thing that's the, 
that's come up here is what are we showing for homes and septic fields on this plan? So the home footprint you see on this plan is over 2,700 square feet. So the footprint that you see there is 2,700 square feet. So you could probably build a ranch style home at 2,700 square feet or more, a little bit more, or you know, a colonial with two stories in that same box. Then what we did for the septic field sizing, so we need to provide for a primary field and a reserve field. So with that, we have sized that such that based on the, the soils information we have we've have at the site that that septic field sizing could serve four or more bedrooms. That's how the county uh, establishes the size. So it could serve four or more bedrooms in moderate soils or better. So it may have the opportunity to also that same area serve six or more bedrooms because of some of the soils we found there that, to be good for, the, for this kind of um, use. Of the drain. Tom, can I ask you a question? Yeah. I know you, um, are you still planning to use the city water for the parallel plan? Yep, so no, I don't know no, the par parallel plan. Right. Well, the so parallel. with the parallel plan, we're proposing each lot would have a on-site drain field and septic system. So it uh, would have a drain field or drain field trenches, have a uh, um, septic tank or two, and it would have a water well. So it would have its own well. Okay. It would have its own well. Mm -hmm. And with that, we've also accounted for the well isolation um, to happen within this plan on the lots. Or I should say, it overlaps such that it doesn't interfere. There's, there's no overlapping of the well isolation and the septic fields in this plan. So, say that again, I'm sorry. So with this plan we're proposing, for example, if you see, uh, can you pass me my... In this central spot here, we've shown the wells to be placed in the rear yards of the lots and the septic fields in the front so that there's no overlapping yes. uh, of the, the well isolation. Required by code, we see 1,000 feet separation. So, no, we, no, no, no. so we've assumed for this that we would be held to a, a more strict standard of 100 feet isolation. Um, you can cut that down um, to a smaller isolation distance if the soils are appropriate for that. So in some cases, we might have isolation of 100 feet or 50 feet, depending on what the soils are. Did you, when you thought about the um, placement of the wells, so the wells would be, the, if I'm reading your, your map here right, the wells would be closer to the home area because you're going towards 94, Elizabeth, all of that. Again, Instead of it being in the, well, I guess it depends so, on how the homes are positioned. So we don't want to build this plan. And okay. the way we show the wells and the septic could be swapped. We could show the wells at the front and the septic fields towards the back. Okay. But we probably wouldn't have an opportunity to go every other lot uh, and swap them. If that makes sense, well front, something back. We could um, to some extent, but what we've really done with this is shown that each of these lots at one acre have that ability to provide septic and well and then throughout the whole site. One of the other things that we talked about, uh, maybe a little bit more at a follow-up meeting we had um, since our last meeting with the Planning Commission with a group of stakeholders, was the idea of sustainable elements for the PUD project. So we are providing stormwater infiltration and best management practices for our stormwater system. We are providing open space and preservation of the natural features um, and working to minimize the impacts on that. We talked, uh, I talked with the developers, uh, Sean and Jim, and with the houses that could be purchased here and built, um, there will be, they will be built to the current energy codes and regulations. They are proposing to continue to have the opportunity for electric vehicle charging option in the garages. They are also, they will make also available a solar option. So if you're purchasing a home, you can purchase a solar option with that home and also a electrification option with the home. So um, the other thing that uh, may not be apparent unless you've read all the notes with regard to stormwater is that phosphorus fertilizers would be prohibited here. 
and that we would be using native seed mixes and planting. So the areas that we're working uh, outside of the, the lots would have native plantings, native streetscape plantings, and seed mixes and so on. Uh, we did, since our last meeting, uh, should be included in your packet, is get an update, updated OHM review. They continue to recommend approval and meeting here tonight with you. They just struck a number of things and added to the list of what permits are required and so on. Um, I hadn't seen a new review by Carlisle Workman, so I think we're all working from that same one. Um, the Row Commission, again, they have looked at our traffic generation, so we gave them trip generation information. We gave them our turn laden study and access uh, memos and calculations, and they've determined at this time that they don't need anything further for us to move forward. Um, they have stated that with our project and what you see on your plans that we have the acceleration and deceleration lanes at our entry. <coughs> So those will be constructed with the project. And then we have, with this recent um, resubmittal, had plans delivered to the Water Resources Commissioner's Office for their continued preliminary approval of the project. So um, we would anticipate from their office, our next step is to get any final comments or obtain preliminary approval, which is something we need for final site plan. So we're heading in the right direction there. Um, and we will have some future infiltration testing that is part of the project. The Road Commission approved. So the Road Commission approved the application for the Road Commission approved. So the Road Commission has reviewed our trip generation, mm -hmm. our um, site distance. So there's a plan in there that has site distance triangles and everything. They've approved that. They have reviewed, they asked us <coughs> to determine whether or not we would need a turn lane. So that would be widening the road. And all those things that they've re uh, reviewed have indicated that we don't need a, a traffic study, a full traffic study. We are below the threshold for that. We don't have a project that would um, create the need to have a you know, dedicated left turn lane in front of our development because we're below the threshold for that. And that the only thing we would need to do is include acceleration and de deceleration lanes, which uh, if you're familiar with that, that those are built on our side of the property. So if you're turning right in, you could kind of move over and turn in. And if you're pulling out, you could, if uh, you, you needed it, there would be a little lane to accelerate in. Uh, we did receive a review from Dr. Lemke, uh, representing the township with regard to the hydrogeologic investigation work plan. Um, he, and and um, if you have questions, feel free to ask. Mark is the expert here on this. Um, I'm gonna kind of paraphrase a number of things I've highlighted that stood out to me. He references the work plan that was approved by EGO confirming that. He's referencing what Sio Township would like to know with regard to how the work plan addresses the proposed wastewater discharge and its opportunity maybe to alter patterns of groundwater flow and move, or move higher concentrations of the dioxane to existing residential water wells in the surrounding area. Um, he did also note in his review that um, there are concerns over offsite influence that could be mitigated if the proposed modeling is included or as included in the work, work plan demonstrates the effects of groundwater mounding associated with the anticipated discharge largely confined to the development site. So again, we're talking about that um, what some might consider a modest amount of water uh, in our infiltration bed. So our wastewater comes to the treatment plant, gets treated, and then it releases quote unquote clean water into the infiltration bed to soak into um, that infiltration bed and that aquifer. So the notion is, could that mounding of water as it infiltrates, will that remain on site or within the proximity of the site where it's being released? That's something that the hydrogeo study would get into. 
He also had a number of recommendations in his review. Um, he talks about methods and procedures for modeling. He says models could take the form of an analytical solution to an equation such as uh, Hantish 1967 used to predict groundwater modeling beneath the infiltration basin. That's the proposed model that I understand Mark and his team will be using to study this. And that the state approved. And that the state approved. The modeling process should also include sensitivity analysis to evaluate the dependency of results on uncertainties, including um, the assumed discharge rate, maybe having a more conservative upper limit and proposed development discharge should be evaluated and the inferred horizontal and vertical hydraulic conductivity uh, and the effect of lower values should be evaluated. So kind of looking at the model and understanding and adjusting it in different ways. Um, this, these comments we hadn't heard until this letter was uh, issued. So what we would like to, you know, Mark would be doing is having a conversation to review with Dr. Lemke and determine the specifics of the sensitivity analysis for those two things to see what the, uh, those parameters uh, would be in the study. Uh, the other thing is the anticipated discharge met, uh, method should be identified and incorporated appropriately into groundwater mounting model. Um, that would, of course, be identified in the study, if, whether it's a drain field or infiltration, uh, uh, rapid infiltration absorption field kind of thing. So we would certainly be providing that in the study um, and analyzing what system that would uh, best work in our certain circumstance here. And then the last thing he says, in addition to uh, analyzing the number of items that uh, Mark and his team were going to look going to look at were taking water samples and monitoring wells should be also analyzed for the 1,4 dioxane. And uh, if that's desired, I mean, that can be done as well. So many of those things uh, can be addressed and will be addressed uh, as we move forward. Socioeconomics and project benefits, there's a list here. We've kind of run through a number of these as we've, we've worked through uh, multiple presentations here. Uh, it is a big project. It will take a number of years to construct. There will be about 120 people that will live in this development as projected, uh, and it will have some tax revenue um, that will benefit a number of different municipal entities. Again, we're a cluster development, which allows us to have less pavement. So the deviations we have with our lot sizes, widths, depths, setbacks, and those kinds of things allow us to develop the site in a manner that clusters us and allows us to save um, and preserve open space, trees, wetlands, so on. We have a number of recreation opportunities. Uh, the water main infrastructure is a project benefit. We are proposing a fire service contribution. We are proximate to a number of work centers in the city of Ann Arbor. We're along an existing transportation corridor, and the goal here is to provide more attainable housing uh, in an area that has close proximity to where people want to be. So our goal tonight is to re requestfully request from the Planning Commission uh, recommendation for preliminary approval of the PUD. Contin I'm sorry, I said that backwards. <laughs> I would respectfully request a recommendation of the preliminary PUD be approved contingent upon the completion of a hydrogeologic study. As you know, there's a number of factors here that will input into how that study um, takes place in the findings, location of wastewater treatment plant, number of lots, and so on. We've talked about that before uh, and can talk more about that with Mark here if you have questions about it. So that's really what I have to share with you. Um, again, we had the opportunity to share digitally and paper copy. I've shared a number of bits of information, so hopefully everybody has that this time. So thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to start off by saying thank you for providing the documents to us. Uh, questions from the Planning Commission? Well, I have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned the, the Lemke 
memo. So a couple of things that um, um, I noted in the memo in the second paragraph, he uh, indicates that the work plan, which is the WPS work plan that you mentioned, um, is to determine if the soils and aquifer characteristics at the site can hydraulically assimilate wastewater discharge uh, from a proposed residential development. Um, and so the concern is, as I understand it, um, is that the discharge could possibly um, affect the plume and its movement. Um, he also goes on to say that the Sio Township would like to know the work plan will address concerns that the proposed wastewater discharge could alter the patterns of groundwater flow that could move higher concentrations of dioxide to existing residential water wells in the surrounding area. So not just in the KFC site, but also in surrounding areas. Um, and I presume that that's what we're trying to find out with the hydrogeological study, right? Are we on the same page about that? I, I can't stop. <laughs> no, I'm asking you no, a question. Sorry, are got, we on I the got, same sure. page with that, that study? Yeah. Well, sh could determine that yeah, for well, us. Let me give a little bit of background first. So I'm a certified professional geologist, and I've been doing hydrogeologic work. I found out the other day that I am now the old guy because I've been doing it for four decades. Um, and so I've been doing this for a long time and done them in Sio Township. Uh, I was the hydrogeologist on the Encore Heritage Woods site, and I'm looking at another one in the township also, uh, and along with this site. So, and, and the rules that these come under, the Part 22 groundwater discharge rules, when those were formed 20 something years ago, I was actually helping write those rules. Uh, so I've been involved in this type of work basically for a, a lot, for around a long time. Um, so we wrote the work plan, follow the guidelines that the state has, say, you know, you have to do these certain things, look at what the soils are, look at what the aquifer are, what all the characteristics are, and see if first that the ground, if you put it, the treated wastewater on the ground, that the ground can take it away. And, and there's really two parts to that. There's, is the unsaturated soil capable to let the water pass through it? And the second part, is there a water body, an aquifer underneath it, that can then issue that water away? Because if you just have sand sandwiched between two pieces of clay, the water goes in, it's got nowhere to go. And so there's no parts from a hydrogeologic standpoint uh, that we have to look at. And so when we wrote the work plan, um, submitted into the state and also submitted it to Dr. Lemke, uh, had some conversations with him before and after, uh, he gave me a whole batch of information from some work that some of his students had done. And I looked carefully at that and tried to incorporate those parts of that work that were close enough to the KFC property that they made sense to me as a hydrogeologist. And with all that, I kind of form, we call them a conceptual site model. Say, hey, at this property with all the information that we have, what do we think is going to be there? And we've got some on-site work that's been done. And so I was able to use that, the water well logs in the area, geologic cross sections, and try to incorporate all that stuff and say, all right, this is now what I need to do on the site to answer the questions that are coming up. And Dr. Lemke, not only in the memo, but in his email that you should look at, and he says, given the relatively small volume of wastewater discharge and relatively high conductivity values elsewhere in the aquifer system, it's my expectation the limited radius of influence that a limited radius of influence is likely the outcome. However, the data needs to be collected to find that out. And, and that's what I'm here for. Um, You're here for to do what? Well. To let you know what the, the data that we need to go and collect is there. And I can't really answer any questions until I get that on site data. My, and there's some other parts of this. When I look at what I call a conceptual site model, 
we know there's some clay at the surface and then there's a sand body and then there's more clay and more sand bodies underneath it. The well that is on site is really deep and that well on site is in the aquifer where the Gelman plume has been identified offsite in other places. The Gelman plume has not been identified on that property. Right, the, the detection so Mr. level. Mr. Stedman? Sweatman. The Gelman Swetman. plume does not exist on that property with the data that we have right now. We understand that. Okay. We're aware. Mr. Colbert informed us of that at the last meeting. I want to state it for so the I want, I want, I, I, I've seen your work plan. Okay. okay. I, I just want to readdress my question. Sure. I'm not asking for results because we don't have the hydro right. study yet. So we can't give results. So but here's your, my question. To answer your I'm going to ask it again. I'll so I'm going to focus in on it, okay? Right. Question is, is, from this memo, is that we're looking at this hydrogeologic hydro geological study to give us an answer about how the wastewater discharge could alter groundwater flow that could move higher concentrations of dioxin to existing residential water wells in the surrounding area. Do you agree that the hydrogeological study could do that? There's a problem with that question. To be frank, no, let me, you, know, you asked the question and I, I, have, the I have to put my You side. had the memo, you saw yes. that in the memo, right? Okay, you, but you memo. saw this in the memo, right? You read the memo, right? Okay. So, so you're not surprised that I would ask you that question. No. Go ahead. So the, the presumption is that there is contamination there in that question. That's not what he said in his memo. That's not what, that's not what I'm saying in my question. All right, so the other part of it that we are doing. So is, I'm going to say it again. That's not what I'm saying in my question. And that's why we're doing the study to find out what the effects of the wastewater, I should get my termination right, discharge could have on altering the conditions of the surrounding residents, right? Again, I, so, so, are, so, are, so, I mean, I'm kind of a, a neophyte, so you're the expert, but just so you understand what my, the intent of my question is, is that despite the fact that the existing well on the site is not contaminated per your reports, the question is, will the wastewater treatment discharge alter patterns of the groundwater that could move higher concentrations of dioxide that affect the other residents? So we already know you haven't found it in the well. The question, did, do I don't need to say the question again, do I? Okay. But does that make sense to you that, or you just, that I'm just way off base in asking no, no, that question. I understand. And so, and that's where the conversations that I want to have with Dr. Lemke come in. Because in his memo, he came up and said, I could use an analytical solution or a numerical model simulation. It's right in his memo. To, to analyze the data. To analyze the mound analysis of the data. Right? Correct. Right. And so in using the analytical solution, the hand tush model, which is basically the same thing that's used by USGS. There are some things in there about sensitivity analysis that you wanted to look at. And that will help answer your question of what are, what are the flow patterns going to be like on site? And so the answer is we are, we've got that analytical way to, to look at it. And then he's also suggested possibly a numerical model. And so I want to have that conversation with him and say, hey, look, here's the analytical solution that we've talked about to help answer the question that you come up with. And that's the one that we had state approved. And I'd like to go along that way. If he and I can't come to agreement, he says, no, we want to do something else, then we'll have to see what that something else is. I, I can say with relative confidence that he that we want the model um, because from discussions with him, I didn't get that it was either or. or. I mean, he, he wants the sensitivity piece, but the model was what he, we spent quite a bit of time discussing. And the fact that in 
the plan, the model, the, uh, the way the model was going to be constructed wasn't clear. Um, it, we spent quite a bit of time and that, but that was really the focus that to refine, to describe um, and, and again, he would want to, we, Sayo would want him to approve that, the description of the model. So, because we need to be, we want to be as, um, uh, we want the data to be as good as we possibly can to determine whether or not this particular development is proposed will influence the, the government flow. And so I'm going just by what I, what I was, so I haven't had the conversations with them. I was tempted to give them a call right away and say, what do we gotta do? But I wanted to do that here today first. And so when I look under his recommendations on page two, he says models could take the form of colon, an analytical solution, or a numerical finite difference or finite element model. So he's, he's got those two that are in there. And so I've got to have the conversation with him that what is it in the analytical solution that I would have to do to satisfy his questions? Or is he just so fit on the numerical model, the finite elephants model that he wants that one done? So I'm just going by what's here. And so I'm a little bit in the dark myself. So, because I, again, I've done these for decades and have always used that Hantush solution basically to do the prediction of what the response to the underlying aquifer is going to be. And then the other part that we really need to look at in this is what aquifer are we discharging into? Because are we discharging into the Gelman plume aquifers that have contamination down gradient, or are we discharging into an aquifer that has no impact to it? So it, it really depends on what the site hydrogeologic conditions are to see, I've got to answer that basic question first of where's the discharge going and where's the contaminant plume? Because there's multiple very thick layers of clay that separate these different aquifers at the site. Yeah, yeah, I totally understand. I think you're well, right on with that. You're just getting in the weeds a little bit. I was asking well, a global question, yeah, which is, it comes from my will the <laughs> proposed wastewater discharge alter patterns of groundwater flow that could higher, move higher concentration of dioxide in existing residential water wells in the surrounding area? And like Some reason you don't want to answer that, but and, and I like, presume you agree with that statement that that the high geological study will give us an idea about that. It will give me an idea of what the hydrogeologic conditions are of the site. Okay. And, okay. And, and as Dr. Lemke has said, the magnitude of that mound therefore brings in the magnitude of the evaluation that has to be done. If the mound height is so small, you know, and if we find the right soils, and when we put the water in, it just gets taken right away. There is no mound and there's no diversion of groundwater flow. So there is no issue. If the soil can- I see what you're saying now. Yeah. About, because he did talk about, you have to determine what that mound is. How big is it? Is the mound gonna be one foot high or is it gonna be 10 foot high or 50 feet high? Whatever the mound is will have an effect on not what the was, the, whether or not, not the discharge is. If the mound height is small, and stays on site, it's not going to affect anything off site. We're saying the same thing. Right. You're right. saying, I, so I agree with you. We, we do need to, need to know about our the study <laughs> to the get question. the answers that all of us want. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the weeds that we would know from the study that will tell us if it will, the discharge will have an effect on the groundwater flow. Yeah, and I need to that's ask, and, and the other, frankly, and they, these guys don't want to really hear this. Sorry, <laughs> but I need to pass go of saying, hey, the site that we think is going to work, is it really going to work in the first place? Are the conditions that we need just to get the water through the soil and into an aquifer there? I don't really know that. I think they are, but I don't know that. And, and I've had other sites where people have gone and say, we, somebody comes in and they have a plan. They say, I want my wastewater plant there. 
Well, maybe, but maybe it belongs down here. And so that's kind of the stage I'm at right now of hoping, and for what we've looked at so far, this area looks like it's gonna work, but I don't have that on-site deeper data to make sure that that's the case. Yeah. Okay, do you have a- Very specifically about that statement, you're going to perform the study assuming that it's in the location defined by Absolutely. the way. Okay. Yep. And if that fails, you might look elsewhere. Is that what you just said? If but that has to happen, yes. Okay. Okay. And then and then Tom gets mad at me because I've screwed up all his plans. No, but you're going to use the site as children. It's designed with nature. Ian McCarg, an old do you know Ian McCarg? <laughs> Design with nature. Design with nature, yep. So that's exactly what we're doing, is we're trying to design this based on what the conditions are and making this work. So, all right, we have the, the issue of the um, hydrogeological test, and I, I want to also see if there are other questions about, because there are other issues of community benefits, um, I know I had a question. Does the do the pathways connect anywhere so the public can use those pathways to the site? We don't connect any public right away or anything, so there is no opportunity. You know what I'm saying? That, no. It's not a public benefit; it's a private. Benefit. It's a private park. Yeah. But they're open to the public. We'll ask for them to be open to the public, but. The public would have to drive into the subdivision to get to it, but we are proposing a if the, if and when there's ever a uh, trail or a path down um, next to Ann Arbor Road, and we'd give the right of way or the easements for that. Maybe a benefit in the future. We could, yeah, and we we would, we could put it in there. You're not going to have to buy, or you guys want, but whoever wouldn't have to buy the easements or um, through eminent domain ticket. But currently, it doesn't it doesn't tie to any other public pathways or anything else. I also had a question about, and this is we talked about density a little bit last time, and um, you know there's a range that the planning commission can can look <clears throat> at, and I do have to say I think um, you know with the seventy percent um, of of uh, um, the open space is is great. I I just have two issues with lots thirty nine and forty, just because of the one. There are you know I think three landmark trees impacted by those sites, and there's an awful lot of grading associated with those two lots. And so I sort of feel like uh, when there's a range of density, you kind of look at what makes sense, and I would sort of question if those two lots aren't really trying to get squeezed in as opposed to really respecting the uh, topography and the um, so the existing land. Are two of the western five lots on the south side of the loop. Um, because there's a whole lot of grading going on there. I'll have to bring that up for the public to see. Sorry, and if you show that, I think if you can pull up the grading plan, it really shows um, some pretty <coughs> steep. It, it, yeah, and then those grading, so those probably be walkouts, those probably be premium lots there, is walkout lots that people tend to desire. Um, but again, you talk about the range of, you know, one to two and a half acres per, if you, if you look at the zoning area and where we're at, all our surrounding zonings are all R2. I mean, so I agree that R2? R2, R2 is a zoning adjacent to us. And egg. Egg. So if you look, if you go back to the, the site that shows, RC. we're zoned RC, correct. You're, you're correct. But the adjacent zonings and kind of the, the property between Ann Arbor Dex Road and, and I-94 or 14, where it kind of comes up, there, tends to be the R2 zoning. So when you look at transitional zoning, you look at densities, the more north you get, the more rural you get, that tends to be more your two acre lots. 
your previous zoning all kind of keeps the higher density along the highways. So if you look at the range, you would say, hey, the range here is along the highways. This is where the higher density ranges go per your own zoning. Correct. I'm looking at the this plan mm -hmm. and the dense and, and the lots, the way that you've laid them out. And yeah, so that sort of showed that's the one I wanted was, um, you know, you've got you're you're really doing quite a bit of grading and the result of that grading is also removing more trees um, to achieve that grading. So just when I'm looking at the lot and you know you wanted some indication of sure, no, the I density agree. and so I'm just bringing up those two lots as, as being of, of concern. And, and again, we, we looked at the, the open space to the, would be the far west there is all, why don't we could take those five lots, we could up, stick them right up there in an open field. But we looked at from a planning standpoint for the, the neighborhood itself, if we move those lots up to that open space, we could preserve trees. Yes, absolutely we could. But what it takes away is now the ability for all those residents to enjoy the park atmosphere, the pavilion, everything. So this uh, plan as it sits there, opens the whole western side of the site as a benefit to the to the, all the residents there. If we put the five lots there, it takes that benefit away. We also looked at the historical photos, we looked at, you know, yes, there's trees there, but they are very young scrub trees. There's no... Three landmarks. I counted them right. But I, this oh, okay. is my feedback. Sure, and, and I appreciate it. And I mean, I truly do. Um, so is there a compromise where maybe we could slide, you know, Two lots over there. Two then? lots over there, and and in doing preliminary PUD, preliminary site plans, and all those kinds of things, when we show grading for lots, I'm trying to estimate my lot grading on this such that I'm maybe more conservative and showing more impacts than I might, because I don't want to have an issue where you this gets built and you come back and you say you took out a bunch of trees, you said you wouldn't. In this case, lots 39 and 40. So we come off the road, we rise a little bit, create our, our spot, our little pad site for the home to be built. And then our goal is to have those be view out our walkouts and then we can get to grade faster. We just get to grade, we, we just use the lot to get to grade on this. And then the fronts of these would drain to the, the road and everything in the back, the grass would drain off. And the natural course. So there, there is probably the opportunity to tighten that grading up on these lots. There is the opportunity to rotate them around um, and maybe you know not utilize all of that. Yeah, we, we could move to there and still keep the open for the the community. Uh, you know, yeah, that's pretty um, yeah. When you're done. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, what? Well, on that issue, the density is based on the parallel plan that Carlisle Wartman still says is not a reasonable one. And I, I look at the parallel plan and see septic tank, septic fields um, outside of the well of exclusion areas, but I see some of them uphill of the wells and some downhill, some uphill of neighboring wells. They're so close together. There's so much grading on this site that I don't, it just puts wells close together and interfering with each other. It's, it's not something that could be built. The, the, the well isolation, you know, those is, isolations. Not to you. This is my comment to Carla Wharton to find out more about what you feel the parallel plan well, the, the, um, feasibility is. Yeah, so the uh, couple things with the parallel plan. So of course, if you're looking at an open space project or a PUD based on, you try to begin a density based on what could happen under old fashioned kind of standard development uh, processes. <clears throat> so in this particular case, because the property of the master plan designation of medium density, which would allow a R1 zoning designation, but as, Pan, as uh, Jan has pointed out, um, it's also a range of density. So it's 
Township is under no obligation to accept one unit per acre. It's in a range of one to 2.5 units per acre. Uh, if, if we rezone it from RC. And that and that that range is supposed to be that is supposed to be based in part on what's going on on the on the property itself. We're yeah. supposed to consider what's you know. There's a range for a reason. There's a range. It's not automatic. Um, and so that's kind of the basis. What the applicant has done is proposed a one acre uh, proposal for their parallel plan. And that one acre proposal would reflect an R1 zoning district. Now, since our comments are that are in our April 24th review, the applicant has made some changes to the density plan. I will say at right, you know, right now from a plan perspective, dimensionally, they've addressed our previous comments. Dimension. Yeah, dimensionally. Uh, so that the lots are all one acre, they all have proper road frontage. There's no more of these odd kind of hammerhead or T-turnarounds that were quite a long time proposed. And so in theory, if the set, if soils were perfect and wells were perfect and all of this worked, uh, that is a viable plan. Um, that's making an assumption that the township did allow an R1 zoning designation. But that would be a viable plan. And the applicant has tried to indicate this evening that the soils are adequate, at least that's what they've represented to us this evening. Um, the soils, as you see from our report, we use the Washtenaw County, or the uh, actually USGS soil survey, which is general. I will admit it's, a gen it's general in nature, but it does indicate some problems with soils. Um, that would be, a, I think, an important point for the applicant to expand upon, uh, to, to you know, maybe let us know if they've done an additional soil sampling that might um, that might better reflect the possibility of the number of units that they're proposing. Um, and even if they could, then that direction that the master plan provides a range of one unit per acre to one unit per two and a half acres. It's supposed to be based on what's going on. And again, I'm saying if we allow rezoning per the surrounding area, right now it's RC, which is one of the five. So we have a range from one to five, not just one to two and a half that we should be considering. My, my follow up to what you just explained about the dimensional um, changes, it still doesn't change the uh, grading. This is not a, a field that's been uh, laid out in a grid. This is a hilly tree lot, um, a large tree lot with hills. There's sizable gra grades. There's a pond. There's um, every reason to believe that there would be issues with some of the lots, if not, if not exactly like the GIS surveys, it would at, at least some of the lots could be expected to have some issues. I don't think that's an unreasonable statement that some of the lots have had issues. I, this is this always gets into that that uh, I want to say catch twenty two, but the area of how much information does the township require to feel satisfied with the parallel plan? Do you want them to do perks on every lot? Do we want you know? I mean, it gets to be a point where where do we draw the line? Is what, what satisfies the planning commission ultimately the township board that this is a viable plan? Um, now, one other point I would I would mention with the parallel plan is that so we're we're the applicants showing 37 one acre lots, which I believe now dimensionally meet what the township would require for an R1 project. Uh, but I think we haven't talked about it in a while, but the applicant is proposing um, the density bonus based on the PUD. So not only is 37 what they're showing in the parallel plan, they're proposing actually 47. So they're proposing a 10 unit bonus. So that I just point that out as well. So not only are they putting it at the maximum of one per acre, but then they're requesting 10 bonus. Yes. Yeah. So the density, and then when you ask specifically about two of the lots, you get, we get a lot of pushback. So it's it's like keep the 47 as, it, as proposed in some manner. And I think we're getting right down to 
how dense should we be allowing in this particular site, which is historically been a park field in a surrounding in an area that's surrounded by low density residential. Other commissioners, do you have some questions? Uh, yeah, can you bring up a slide where you show the you know, uh, solar option, charging option? Uh, I can't remember. Uh, uh, Sustainability. Uh, the slide where you had, uh, I want to bring it up and then talk to it. <laughs> charging stations. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> So these things that you talk about here, uh, solar option, uh, what does it exactly imply? People who want to have panels on the roof can opt for that, others cannot? If they want to purchase, if, they, if some people want to have solar panels on the rears of their roof, they, that would be an option that they could. This option. So if they on chose, the rears of their roof? I, I guess on the rear of wherever the, they need. The, the sun side. So. My question is, is this place positioned to provide that kind of facility, the angle of the sun, et cetera, et cetera, whatever that is, or is it just? I, I guess it would, there's some would be on the rear, some would be on the fronts. So is this location lot appropriate right for, you know, there's a great, there's some kind of information that the government, your house is suitable for this or not suitable for that? So is this subdivision suitable even to take such panels and, and, and be able to produce electricity, and et cetera, et cetera? So these houses would be- oriented. What's the index call? I'm forgetting the name. It comes to my, my bill every month. Um, these houses are oriented all but the four lots on the east side are oriented. So the longest dimension is going to run east-west. So. Have you so the, if you're looking at this image of the house, so they would have rooftop. Yeah, no, that's not the point. That's not the point. They, they can have them anywhere they feel like. My question is, is this subdivision oriented in such a way geographically, I'm forgetting the exact term, that they can accommodate these panels? Some houses cannot because the, the angle of the sun and the earth is such that there's no benefit to this. So the index which the government or somebody creates. Right? So if, for instance, east and south is the best. No, not even that. It's more, it's, it's more precise, but he, he would know that. I mean, it's more precise than that. Not east and west alone. Everything, everything is east and west, I guess, in the overall scope of things. Well, uh, it, it, it's it, the it, angle of the roof. Yeah, so, oh, so that's my question, I guess. And it uh, looks like, I mean, because it's like saying, yeah, I want to, I'm not sure what index you're looking at, but the way these are oriented, yes, we would have that opportunity. I'll have to look up the specific. Oh, no, there is one. There is one, definitely. Uh, in my build, uh, something that comes up. I live I further know. north in here, and <clears throat> the index there is anyway, perfect. For so solar. I guess the question then, okay, so let's assume this place is suitable for that. Let's assume for a minute, hypothetically. I don't know if it is or not. Some people may say, no, we can't afford it, so we don't want it. So. That kind of the approach, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that anybody would purchase this option. They would have the option to purchase it or not. Or not. Okay. That kind of uh, doesn't so necessarily would, mean that it would be a green so they, subdivision. Would, would right. the units be, Everybody would save money, right? Would the units be solar ready at least? Even if they didn't want it right now? Meaning use the structure and the wiring yeah. and the and it for it? What you, yeah, that's a good question. When you go at, at the structure of almost all your modern buildings, if you build them cold, there's enough systems out there that will accept them. Because I've gotten with some of the others. There stuff. is a specific de definition for solar ready um, mm -hmm. that the DOE has. Um, and yeah. Um, so and in order to be uh, also effective, they would need to be all electric or all electric ready. And I haven't heard anything about that. Um, I mean, they they have the option to do that. I mean, this package that you put forth mm -hmm. is almost available from any builder in Washtenaw County. 
right now. Uh, and other, and this is a PUD. And as we're evaluating the community benefits of this, we're, we're seeing pushing the density. That's not a community benefit. We're, we're seeing, okay, we got a fire hydrant. That is a community benefit. You know, I think being able to fight fires is a community benefit. We have no access, you know, it, it, for, you know, the 70% of the space that's being dedicated to open space to the public. They really have to come in and, you know, all eyes on neighborhood watch who's coming into our subdivision. Um, yeah, and yeah, uh, so I'm, I'm really struggling with, um, this is a, a PUD that is supposed to have, have benefit. This has been a recreational space, you know, used by the community um, over a long historical period. So I'm, I'm seeing legacy carbon emissions, no public access, um, and really pushing uh, the density and a reluctance to go ahead and do the testing that we need to um, understand and be able to protect the neighbors um, and the impact of the Gelman plume. So I'm really having trouble right now. If I, if I could just- And, you, and John, do you wanna? I'll wait. And, and gentlemen, I just, to your faces, I wanna say that I don't support this and I'm gonna be opposing it. And I'm gonna be opposing it because I don't see sufficient community benefit. And uh, I look at chapter 36, which is our zoning code. And it talks about adequate protection of the public health, safety, and welfare. And I'll certainly defer to the expert Roger Rail on that and our own expert on our panel, uh, Kim Moore on that, uh, for, for more on that. But more importantly, under uh, 36-245C2A, a recognizable and material benefits to the ultimate users of the project and to the community where such benefit would otherwise be unfeasible or unlikely to be achieved without the PUD. We're building essentially an enclave. Um, we we uh, uh, approved a PUD a few weeks ago at the board, but that was for a, a community benefit that has all kinds of senior living and memory assisted, but the, but the community benefits were over half a mile in path it was solar, it was to help build a bridge over the freeway. If we want to have, have that there, it was also um, uh, EV charging, lead certification. Uh, they built a, um, a MDOT approved uh, turnaround of, that other commercial property owners are going to be to benefit from. They donated 150,000 to a fire and then 150,000 to either uh, utilities or path. Oh, they also, at the meeting, they pledged to work with um, 501c3s or organizations who help seniors, and they agreed to be hooked up to our municipal sewer if that comes in down the pike, down Baker Road, which is far more commercial. When we approved the crossroads, they have the utility, the utility department benefits from that, the fire department does, they're gonna build a pathway, they're gonna connect that community with you know, you can you be able to walk to Ann Arbor or you get to the Sio Ridge where we're doing pathways. It's, it's like, it's not an enclave like you guys. You're gonna punch a line uh, from, a, from a car dealership of water underneath the freeway, and then you'll be able to kind of use it for your little destination, um, destination uh, housing complex. And I get that it's a benefit to have water there and a fire hydrant there. But frankly, the main benefit is if that damn Gelman plume starts to infect, uh, impacting wells and we need to get off of uh, um, get off of municipal water and, and go to, and, 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 I'm sorry, get off of well water. Switch that, my expert Kim. Well, to go to municipal. But if that happens, then Gelman's obligated to put the water there anyways. So, so uh, I just, I, and, I, and I took a photo of your, of your, uh, of your uh, PowerPoint. Um, I'm trying to do too many things at once. And you've got less pavement, preservation of trees and woodlands, which the others had. Uh, you, you've got a recreation, you're going to have a gathering gazebo, walking, hiking paths to where, play fields used by whom. Um, uh, I guess, 
you do have a fire services contribution. Uh, it is proximity to work centers, but but I guess what's in it for Sio Township to rezone this from recreational you know conservation to PUD? I don't see the sufficient community benefit under Chapter Thirty Six. You know, is it consistent with public health, safety, and welfare? That's under C4. Does it minimize any negative environmental impacts of the subject or surrounding areas? I'll defer to the water experts on that. And importantly, and I think Kathleen Brandt pointed this out and other people pointed this out, and we saw the presentation that preceded us. And is this PUD going to be cons uh, consistent with the goals and policies of the Sio Township Master Plan? And on page 91, we talk where our sanitary service area is. And on page 28 and 31, we talk about it. You know, we, we just got the presentation of where we want generally development to go. Um, and, and it's good, bad, or otherwise, it's for the most part, kind of south of 94, although there are some things north of 94, but they're on freeway exits like Zebra Road or they're, they're, they're on Baker Road. It's not to, again, to uh, just drill or you know, bore a horizontal uh, pipe from a car dealership or well, that's where it's near, nothing against car dealerships. Uh, sorry, Ruthie, I see you're out in the audience. Um, <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, but uh, I mean, that's just where to, 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 to take it from there. I just don't see sufficient community benefit. And that's why I don't support this plan tonight. And I want to say it to your faces and it might, it's not what you want to hear, but it's that's at least my perspective on it. And I appreciate you putting the uh, community benefits up there, but I don't see those to be sufficient community benefit for people who live all over Sound Sio Township rather than the instant uh, residents. Can I ask if, if there's a housing crisis that we're going through right now, a lack of housing, lack of affordable housing, where would you like in the township? What's I mean, because we've been here for 20 some years, and so we'll we'll What's find another piece of property. What's the price point on these? What's the price point on these? Yeah. With everything that we're doing in here now and getting to here, uh, these will probably be Six seven hundred thousand dollar houses because because, because little, of because little craftsmen little little ranches are going are going for six hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars and these seem no no disrespect to them but these seem uh, fancier and much nicer living uh, these are going to be close to a million dollars don't you think if if eight hundred thousand dollars for ranches six to eight hundred thousand dollars for ranch in in Sileview? I don't know where the, the those are going for that much, but, but, but hope, you know, I'm just saying that they're, they're, we are trying to bring affordable housing in, and I don't know what, maybe, I shouldn't say the word affordable, because yeah, 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 yeah. nothing, because nothing, yeah, 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 yeah. nothing, attainable, because nothing. And you know, back then it was 400, 500. I know, that was before we had to bring water, you know, I mean, to be honest with you, going to the parallel plane and the, the tree mitigation, what we're paying to bring the water over probably takes care of the tree mitigation course. So, I mean, from a cost standpoint, we could probably go back to, rezone it and go with the parallel plan and be a cheaper development than this year. You wouldn't get that rezoned. I, I mean that, that that's not today's argument. So, and so but you know, the problem for me is you you saw you heard from our engineers. We're kind of stuck to that Jackson Road corridor for I, I heard, I, I heard from your engineers saying the water this was a great location. This would be a benefit to them. I, that, that's what I heard from your engineers. From, from OHM, that, that's that's what I took in. A great benefit to 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 who? It, it, it's a benefit to the, to the fire department. I believe your fire chief said that would be a substantial benefit to the community to have a fire hydrant up there to serve that side of the township. If you ever do the loop, which is in your master plan, you've got what two thousand foot of it already put in place. How many houses can a fire? Is it a single fire hydrant? Yeah. How yeah, many there's houses, there's how, one, the two, three, four. I mean, there's probably, I don't know, eight fire hydrants within the loop. I, I think your point is made yeah. that based on the listed benefits, you're not, you're not, I, I'm not convinced them. compared to what I've seen other PUDs. And, and the other thing is the size the of those PUDs, too. I mean, if you've got, in, in all due respect, that there's economics that come into play. If we have a 400 unit development, there's a little bit more money to, throw at things. When you are doing a 47 unit development and these meetings all cost the same, the engineering all costs the same to do 47 I units. Economy of scale. I really uh, okay, I, I mean, so yes, is there a difference between 45 and 47? 
On an economic standpoint, yes. On a traffic study, it's not even a blip on the radar. On a, any other impervious area, doesn't even, it's not even a rounding year. The only thing it affects is the economics of the, the development. Um, so these other big developments that have hundreds and hundreds of units, it's a lot easier to throw money at things. Yes, yeah, maybe the wrong. We can appreciate that, piece but of property to try to try to develop, develop in that way. Exactly. Okay. Did, to that yeah. Point, uh, uh, that's called a sun number. What is that? A sun number is basically a sun, a number? sun, sun, sun number. Sun number. You're saying? Sun number, like the sun and a number. And basically, on a scale of one to 100, 100 being the idle rooftop for solar scores can be assessed from a valid address and all that based on aerial imagery and algorithms. Anyway. Okay. So, so sun, sun number is what I need to look up? I mean, well, you can do it. There are many other, many other techniques, right? So it doesn't matter which one you do, but is that place even suitable? So if I'm a customer and I say, I really want solar panels, but hey, the sun is not. The angle of the sun and the earth here doesn't match. You can't have it. So what good is it, right? Right. So you're and asking for the sun number, or whatever. Uh, uh, you're not even proposing solar ready. You're yeah. And, solar and, and, and solar ready has some criteria that the exposure has to work. So anyway, um, I yeah. believe no, commissioner. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, let's move Chang on. has something to say. Yeah, well, I'm sorry if you're going to repeat yourself because that was not in the last meeting. Who actually is paying for the 12 inch uh, main that's going to this site? We're, we're paying for everything. So, okay. So, the okay. Will there be other residences that will be eligible to hook into that water main in a, at a future date? No. I mean, anybody can. I mean, there's no residence that's along the main line, but we're taking up to the property line. In there, you know, I don't they're making a and they're yeah. in, the size is 12 inches. Our, our main doesn't run by any other residents, so there's nobody that can kind of tap into it, if that makes sense. We only need an eight, not a 12. Yeah, we only need an eight, but we're up. Inch, then it was eight inches right, because inches. we only need an eight, but we're upsizing it for the township for future expansion. The benefit could be. That. So the benefit could be we're upsizing the pipe. And just looking at it, I think it was lots 39 and 40. Is there a way you've got 24 interior uh, uh, lots in there? Could you reduce them by just a couple of feet and squeeze two more in there? Yeah, or I think, Chris, we can also put them on the kind of north, get my bearing straight here, northwest corner and still keep the open play park. And, and do it. like I said, we really want to focus on the, the back of the subdivision to open up to, to everybody. But I think there's enough room there we can stick those up in there and still you know be a compromise yeah, i'll speak for myself i think i might be in the minority here i have no problem with the density of you know what unit per, per acre out there in fact even the layout i think is it's you know looking at the aerial that mr Coburn showed i think it's the appropriate appropriate place i i definitely wouldn't want to see the alternative built by any stretch of the imagination with the uh, impact on any natural features but i also would agree with a lot of the members as far as the sustainability Yes, it, it should al almost come with it, you know, EV electric, you know, for parking in the garages, uh, you know, whether it's solar capable or not, or at least it's electrification, just, you know, to, as part of the public benefit, not an option, you know, that the homeowners are going to be able to, you know, either purchase or not purchase, depending on the price. I think that should be part of the public benefit. It, 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 we can put a, a break in there. The pro part of the problem is, you may or may, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different chargings, chargers right now. So, you know, we've, so built a lot of homes before, and there's not one fit all charger yet, you know. So at least a level two. What's that? But do be at least yes. a level two. Yeah, at least two. Um, right. So capable for yeah. So I mean, we can yeah. Leave, so, yeah so, so you know what we do is, is we size the panel. You know the, the the panel's size big enough. There's you can put a 50 amp breaker in there if you need to. You know that is all there, but it's up to the customer to pick whatever charging thing they want to put in there. Can I can I ask something pick, piggyback on um, the water issue? I'm just looking at the memo that our utility director put together. Um, he said that the project does not include a double supply loop. 
but instead proposes an internal loop, which will require regular flushing to maintain the water quality. Did you guys get a copy of that? Okay. that demo? okay. Um, so based upon that, his concern in that regard, are you are you thinking of changing that design or? No, you can't on that. It, we've done that in several and they've been approved by Eagle is you have an automatic flushing valve in it that will take care of that. But you have to flush it because it- Yeah, you have to flush it. Water. Is it the- It's a dead end. Right. So we, instead of putting a hydrant there for somebody to go out and flush it with the hydrant, we were doing the automatic flushing valve. Which would allow the fire department access to the water. The utilities people would have access to it to flush it. Which would allow the fire department to have access. The fire to department water. has still has a hydrant they can hook up to. There's hydrants. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a it's a kind of a valve that sets and it actually drains and goes into the uh, storm system, so it doesn't flood anybody out. About the flushing, you mean? Yes. Yeah. Not Kim's question. Yeah, because they were in the same meeting that we talked about with the utilities director. What we're getting is Chris. Yeah. Um, in a no way am I questioning your statement, except to understand it. You said you didn't have a problem with the density of one unit per acre. You were aware. I, you have to be aware. The lots that they're proposing are not one acre each. Correct. This is a 47 acre site, 47 units. So no, it's a 37 acre site. 47 oh, units. Okay. 47 know. units. Because, because, the, because they're asking for a bonus. Okay. So in reality, they're getting the 10. Okay. They're getting a 10 bonus because they're making it a PUD. So it's not just one per acre. The, so they exchanged that as really the 70% open space and best management practices. It, and this is a question I, you know, I just yeah. want to follow. Maybe it's for Mr. Malak. Is there a, a maybe a parks contribution we could ask? Is that is that allowable under this PUD? To if, since this is really for the private residences, is there a formula the township has that let's make a contribution to the parks department? Yeah. No, there's no formula. Okay. I, yeah, it's, it's, it's just like that you know. Uh, yeah, I, 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 is Stacy or Sally on board still for math? Hey, Chris, I'm gonna, does Sally have a parks department? You know, yes. they do, but yes. advisory board. Well, we have a we have a staff on. member. I am, but I didn't know if we could actually ask for a PUD for a contribution to the. To the it's, it's like an advisory. I mean, it's not a full. It's like an advisory. Yeah. So well, Matt, is, uh, Matt is raise his hand. Okay. Doug, yeah. can you repeat that question again? And I can answer. Sorry. Uh, so. So um, I'm looking at the memo uh, put together by the utilities director, Steve, yeah. um, and in it, he says that the project, meaning the KFC project, um, does not include a double supply loop, the water that would be brought in, but instead proposes an internal loop, which would require regular flushing to maintain the water quality. Um, Yep. Eagle yes, normally yes. frowns upon these closed loop systems. So I yes, asked, yes. I asked the folks from uh, Norfolk whether or not they would consider changing that. And yeah. So just real quick, my explanation on that would be um, Eagle Eagle would have to consider that and would have to review and permit it. Um, the single supply would be coming from across 94. Um, you know, one day, if the North Loop was connected, obviously it would be a double loop system. Um, that's what we would prefer. Um, but the applicant has proposed like a flushing valve or a blow off. And so really what that would require is, um, you know, as the subdivision develops, say um, only 10 or 12 houses were there at first, you could get some stagnation in that water. So you'd have to flush that water periodically. Once all 47 houses, if they were to all develop, there would be enough flow through there where you wouldn't have uh, much stagnation if any any issues. And then obviously if you connected to it in the future, ran it east or west, um, 
you wouldn't have any issues. So uh, the utility director is correct. There are some concerns with the maintenance and upkeep of it, but um, it's it's fairly minor. And uh, as the applicant mentioned, they could do some kind of an automatic flushing valve or something like that. So there's solutions around it. Not optimal, but it would be something that Eagle would probably be looking at as well. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Yes. Oh, is the flushing meter? Do you know? It would not be metered. No. So that would be water loss for the township, but um, fairly minimal in the grand scheme of things. Thank you, Matt. Any other questions that people have? So we know that, um, I guess the request is for uh, preliminary approval contingent on the, um, the hydrogeological study um, not showing an impact. And, um, I have a statement to make on that regard, and that is that this body is, is charged with providing an evaluation and an, a finding that the Board of Trustees can then take action upon. And if we say we don't need to look at the study and understand it and, and, and take part in that analysis, then I feel like we're not doing our job. I'd like to see us be part of that. And if I were to have to choose between approving this with that stipulation that it be completed before it goes to the board of trustees, then, or rejecting it, I'd have to reject it. I couldn't approve it today with that. I'd like to see us evaluate. I'd rather put it on hold until they do the study that we asked for until they address the public benefits that Mr. Reiser has discussed until they uh, answer our questions about the density in a different manner than they have. I'd like to see this put on hold rather than approve it with conditions, conditions that the Board of Trustees has to do all the evaluation. So if we approve it, it's a recommendation that goes to the board. If we recommend declining it, it's a recommendation. It still goes to the board. And the board can do with it what they will, and they can do what they will to get it ready for board consideration, whether that's a study or a non-study. They might read the tea leaves and decide where, why pay for a study if the board's not going to approve it or this body's not going to approve it. I mean, that's up to them. I'm prepared to vote this down tonight, but that's only my vote. I'm one of five, six. So, um, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot of thinking about this project. I've read it oh, all. Many hours of thought put into this. Not as much as you guys. I certainly put a lot of energy into thinking about it and reading and stuff and trying to educate yourself. That was why back in a year ago, we decided to meet with our experts to really get a handle on it because all these questions were coming up. Um, I'm not gonna vote for the project until I see a hydrogeological study. I'm uncomfortable with moving forward with a preliminary PUD without knowing that. I think that's uh, fundamental to my being able to approve a preliminary PUD, preliminary site plan. And uh, secondly, I agree with uh, Commissioner Reiser and his concerns about the community benefits. I'm also concerned about, uh, Mr. Hyde has highlighted for us the density issues. Um, it just seems like there's so many things about this project that really aren't your fault. I mean, you, you're taking the land you're trying to build on, you're taking it how it came to you. Um, but there are issues of 
the sun number and the solar ready and the this and that. But those those we could probably work out. I'm sure you guys um, could would work with us on that. It's it's really these density the density issue, this parallel plan, this hydrogeological study, uh, which in my estimation is the most important in community benefits. So for that reason, I am, I am I do want to vote today. I think. Um, I forget your name, sir. I apologize, Jim. Jim. We Jim came back here tonight. With, he wanted a decision last time because we didn't have all the information. He agreed to postponing to today, and um, after having all the information and thinking it through, um, I'm, I'm prepared to vote today. Um, and uh, that would be my recommendation to the board of trustees that it be denied. Can I, you're done with your questions? All right, so we're ready to entertain a motion. Okay. Did, can I, did you wanna? I, I did, I, but I don't wanna interrupt. Okay. And I, I, you know, I think I talked about this last time, you know, again, about the study. Nobody's denying that the study needs to be done. What we're asking, we're trying to get to is, is everything else okay? And that's what, when we asked here, what we're looking for tonight is, is everything else, you know, just take the study and set it aside for one second. Is everything else okay with the exception of it? That's why we're asking for an approval contingent on that study. You're not approving it unless the study comes back, thumbs up or thumbs down. If it comes down, th thumbs down, it's a denial. So- We understand that. There well, but- There are other well, so, so, so what we're trying to get to is, is like, you know, the death, you know, so we're trying to work out all the other issues without spending a hundred and some thousand dollars on a study that we could, if I had that study and it said it was approved today, would you vote for this? Would you vote yes or no? If I had a, a, an approved hydrogeologic study today, would you vote for this project? You want me to answer that? Yeah. If you had Please. a study today that said that the wastewater discharge would not alter the patterns of the groundwater flow that could move higher concentrations of dioxin to existing residential water wells in the surrounding area. I would probably vote for it. You would vote for it? Yeah. So I think so, we so, can, so, 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 so that's what I'm trying to get I mean, there's some other issues like density and all that other stuff. We can, I think we can work those well, things that, that, out. That, that, I think that, you understand I, now, given the remarks of so, 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 so that, so that, that's how important the community benefits to us. Mm -hmm. So I imagine you would come back I work with us on that. So, so that's what we're, I'm trying to work through that. I, I'm not going to agree. You know, I mean, I agree the study gets to be done. And that's why I ask if, if that study was here, would you be okay with everything else? And, it, you know, if your answer was yes. No, there were other issues that I mentioned. So that's what I, I'm hoping we tend to keep coming back to this Gelman thing. I'm like, I'm trying to get through. What are all the other issues over the last year's worth of meetings that we need to, to hammer out that we can all agree upon? And if we can agree upon them, except for this $100,000 study, I guess what I'd like to say egg, is it is chicken and egg, but I think you've heard in it, it, that we're, there are multiple commissioners that um, don't think that there's adequate community benefit, and a lot of that is around it being an enclave, right? um, and uh, the sustainability features are not above what is is pretty average construction in, in Washtenaw County. Um, there are some who are comfortable with the density and there are some that are not. So I'd say that's kind of a split. Um, and I think the, the issue is, I'm not sure we'll get a black and white answer possibly to that question. And part of that for the hydrogeological study and, and Honest to goodness, that is something that you've heard from the community over and over again. That is something that is very, very important. And for us to go ahead and say, uh, we think we can negotiate these things, but it, in a PUD, we're weighing all these factors together. And if it's not black or white, there's a judgment there. And 
by us giving contingent approval, what are we approving? That it says absolutely there will be no effect. And I, I'm not sure we might, we will get that answer. And then you, and then we'll be here debating is it well it's a little effect maybe possibly well, and, and that's, why, that's why that's why last time I, you know that's why it's last time i said what, what criteria you're judging us to and you know nobody really had a good answer you know i mean we're not the experts no well, I, 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 I asked i asked the experts in the room right you know, right and it, it would and be they, you know we would need you know um uh, an overwhelming abundance of scientific evidence that there would be no impact on the on the migration of the flu. I mean, that's what we would need to take care of that issue. To that's take care of that need. issue, I need more public benefit. And you need well, yeah, I do need. <laughs> I need public You're benefit need too. Uh, I'm going. I I just yeah. don't see. They're not offering what other PUDs have offered to the community as a whole. And you don't feel like this. In, 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 so in, this my, in my opinion, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that the environment isn't important, but because that's a finding too. But I'm saying they're even if they get that, even if they say, we got sand up here, so much clay here, so much sand down there, never the twain shall meet. There's still got to be sufficient public benefit for me. And for me, there needs to be a lot more, you know, reduction of legacy carbon emissions. That's a, that's, you know, if, how are we going to meet our carbon neutrality if we're, continuing to invest add to it. Add to it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm with both of those comments. Plus, I have a problem with the density on an RC property that's surrounded by varying low density residences. So I have a problem. There. So it you've got a, a whole range of issues. May I ask, is it, because I'm, I'm probably generally going to be the only person in favor, person in favor of this, uh -huh. but is this something that's, you know, it sounds like it's going down, but can we still negotiate public benefits at a later date? Because I, I too would agree that's the one thing. Yeah, as well, long as there's an opportunity to continue to, to, we don't to ask for more we, public we hand, benefit. We hand over it as we can, as far as we can, but the trustees don't have to accept that. They sure. Ask for more. Yeah, there is a, yeah, I know if Mr. it gets shut right. down, it's just a setback yeah. that they can address yeah. them. So, as long as they get the message, more public benefit. So, so in the master plan, I, 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 and Doug, maybe you can help. Don't you have an identity? Don't you guys identify what is considered public benefits? Is that in the master plan? I think I've, I've read that before somewhere. Page 28, maybe? Yeah. Page 28? Yeah, but there's a phrase there's that says... There's a specific sense of general. Yeah. So it's not but exactly identical. I think the phrase is that this is not an exhaustive list. It's not an ordinance. It's not a checkbox. Suggestions? So there's six of us, and you can entertain a motion. Jim, you and I are going to make eye contact and signal each other as to whether one of us wants to make a motion unless somebody else tries to do it. I'm seeing if I can. Seeing none, I would uh, uh, move that based on, on the information received from the applicant and reflected in the minutes of this meeting, the Planning Commission finds that the Knights of Columbus preliminary PUD plan received by the township fails to meet the following qualification for consideration as a PUD as outlined in section 36-245C uh, of the zoning ordinance. Specific to 36-245C qualifications of the subject parcel, the applicant for a PUD must demonstrate through uh, the submission of both written documentation and site development plans that all the following criteria are met. With respect to criteria number one, the Planning Commission find, uh, does not find that the intent of section 36-244 is met. Number two, the approval of the PUD will result in one or more of the following. A, the Planning Commission 
does not find that sufficient recognizable and material benefits to the ultimate users of the project and to the community where such benefit would otherwise be unfeasible or unlikely to be achieved without application of the PUD regulations. Um, I'm not going to who's B unless somebody amends it friendly uh, after that or C. But with respect to three, the Planning Commission does not find that the proposed type and density of use shall not result in an unreasonable increase in the need for or burden upon public services, facilities, roads, and utilities. Four, I, I base that on 47 houses times however many trips it is going there. Number four, the Planning Commission does not find that the proposed development shall be consistent with the public health, safety, and welfare of the township. Five, the Planning Commission does not find that the proposed development shall minimize any negative impact of the subject site or surrounding land. I'm not gonna collect six, but with respect to seven, I would say that the Planning Commission does not find that the proposed development shall be consistent with the goals and policies of the master plan. Based on the information received by the applicant, uh, and reflected in the minutes of this meeting and the discussion herein, the Planning Commission finds that the Knights of Columbus preliminary PUD plan received by the township fails to meet the findings pursuant to section 36-249D of the zoning ordinance and recommends a denial to the township board for action on the preliminary plan. Specifically with regard to section 36-249D, the Planning Commission does not find that in relation to the underlying zoning, the proposed type and density of use shall not result in a material increase in the need for public services, facilities, and utilities. And, well, I'm going to, yep. okay, that one, uh, in the material increase in the need for public services, facilities, and utilities, and shall not place a material burden upon the subject of surrounding land or property owners and occupants of part of the natural environment. Two, the Planning Commission does not find that the proposed development shall be compatible with the Township Master Plan and shall be consistent with the intent and spirit of this article. Three, the Planning Commission does not find that the PUD shall not change the essential character of the surrounding area. And four, the Planning Commission does not find that the proposed PUD shall be under the I'm not going to, I'm not going to list that one off unless you're recommending that I do, Doug. No. Right. And that would be my motion. Well, second. I, mean, I didn't, I didn't, is there a second? Well, I would like to amend that to say um, the concerns noted in the planners review dated 4-24. Just yeah, just that in making this determination, we the following additional conditions shall apply. It, they don't apply. It, There's it, no conditions. They're not any conditions. It would just be the uh, follow uh, information applies. That's right. The following information. You don't need to have that, I guess. No, unless we're unless we're we're basing our decision in part on that. Yeah, we are. We are. I am. Okay. So in making this determination. Um, uh, the Planning Commission considered the comments in the um, Carlisle Wartman review dated what date? 424-23. Thank you. That would be friendly. I would support that. And I didn't check all of the things on the model motion. Yeah, I think under number two, um, we can find that it doesn't that does not find that a non-conforming use shall be to a material except be rendered more conforming. You can find that. So that's under C. Yeah, you that's like C. The Planning Commission does, does not, not find. find that it, yeah. Okay. And how about six? You can't find that without the data. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we So in other words, Six, the Planning Commission does not find that the proposed development shall 
minimize any negative impact upon the surrounding properties. So we couldn't find that. Okay. I would I would second that. Okay. So we have a motion made by Commissioner Riser and supported by Commissioner Hyde. Further discussion. Call question. Roll call <laughs> vote. Okay, Commissioner Hyde. Yes. Commissioner Sharma. Yes. Commissioner Riser. Yes. Commissioner Chang. No. Commissioner Moore. Yes. And Commissioner Culbertson. Yes. Carrie, what was what, please? Five to one. Five to one. Five to one. Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, moving on to new business. Um, uh, we have the Palmer uh, Warehouse Building Edition. Yeah, do you want to uh, five plus a little break and you guys can come up in the meantime? It's like a stretch. Okay, we're back from the seventh inning stretch and on to the warehouse expansion. So, good evening. Thank you for preparing through. And we're interested to go ahead and present your project, and then we'll hear from our consultant. Okay. Uh, so, we saw you guys back on April 10th for a conditional use um, for a 24,000 square foot addition onto an existing 18,000 square foot uh, building at 7830 Jackson Road currently used as a moving and storage warehouse with a small amount of office up front. Basically, we're extending that out 240 feet to the north, increasing the parking uh, comparatively and uh, introducing another truck dock, but it will be only uh, additional warehouse space, no additional office, no additional uh, water usage from there, no bathrooms or anything. It's just, it just basically expansion of that warehouse. Uh, we're adding a a detention pond onto the site. The site currently slopes pretty much half the site. The northern half all slopes back down to the north existingly currently. Uh, and we are going to be detaining the water that comes off the site now, while allowing it to infiltrate as much as possible. And then uh, if it needs to overflow, it would overflow in the same way that it's, it's going out currently out to the north towards the, uh, the water tower and the uh, the radio antenna back there, out around, eventually out to the wetland that's by 94. So we're definitely open to any uh, questions if, that you may have. But it's really a pretty simple expansion to a business that uh, ran construction my company built in 1997 and looking to expand on. Thank you. So this is a uh, site plan for the uh, this is a site plan uh, review for the, as I mentioned, the Palmer Warehouse uh, addition. As the applicant mentioned, we've seen this uh, two step process because warehousing is a conditional use. They had to go through a process where we determined if use was acceptable. Now we're looking at the site plan. Um, our site plan report is dated May 18th, 2023. And uh, if you've been through it, it's nine pages long. Uh, We've actually reviewed this project twice. Uh, and uh, second time, first time was in March, second time is in May. That can address almost all of our comments from our first review. And we're just down to two uh, items at this point. Uh, you see from our report, the applicant is a little short on parking. Uh, 39 spaces would be required based on ordinance standards. Gapka is proposing uh, 29 spaces, uh, but they are proposing to make up for those 10, actually they're proposing 11 uh, land bank spaces. Those are parking spaces that are located in an area that could be built if they need them, but if they don't need them, then it saves some paving, which is probably a good idea. Uh, however, the Planning Commission has to agree to that. That's one of the things you can agree to. If an applicant is proposing less parking than is required by ordinance, uh, you may allow them to land in spaces. What, what does the ordinance require? 39. Mm -hmm. And we are proposing 29. 
10, uh, 10 short. They're actually proposing 11 land banks because they actually want over what we do this way. We would recommend that approach. So we have been talking about that. Um, our only other comment is that our comment that it would be that site access be reviewed by the township engineer and the fire department. I do believe I saw a memo in the packet from the fire department. Uh, Thank you. And I don't see in the packet a review letter from the fire department. So, um, OHM. Good evening. Um, my review will be short and sweet like Doug's as well. Uh, we recommended approval of this project in our review letter from May 16th. We did not have any outstanding site plan comments. Like normal, we included preliminary detailed engineering comments, but those do not affect our recommendation tonight. Okay. Thank you. Uh, questions for the applicant from the commissioners. You're going to address all that? Yeah, so we, we're looking at the best way to implement it currently. So we've done all the calculations on it. Uh, we can use all the, we can replace all of the, uh, the current usage. Um, and actually we're considering upgrading the, uh, the LED, upgrading the current lighting to LED, it's existing lighting from the 90s. Um, but so we're looking the best way, whether that's a, an outright purchase of a system or get it through a solar loan program. Basically the, the upfront cost is about $80,000 to um to handle the uh, roughly five hundred dollars a month uh, electrical usage that they currently have which will go down but um that's for currently finding out the, the best way to to do that is the the next step uh these the roof for the addition is built in with the collateral load able to withstand uh the weight of it it's about 1900 square foot of uh solar panels would be able to be adequate so just trying to find the best avenue to proceed with that. Awesome. Um, I think um, Michigan Saves has a low income loan program. And also, it, I heard that they are trying to work on a, um, a bridging loan kind of uh, for the tax credit. And yeah, there's a 30% tax credit, yeah, included with that. But it's, it, it's just depends on you know, it's a, it's a whole lot of money up front versus a lot of a lot of gain in the in the back end twenty years from now. But there are some ways that you can get it. Uh, some will just install it for free, and then you just kind of lease it. And back then you lease it, yeah, yeah. Right. which is a lot less return in the in the long run, but it's still a way of doing it and offsetting. Maybe it can be our first net zero building in Sia. There's there's an extremely low power usage currently, so exactly. And yeah, we're pretty much just lighting. That's uh -huh. that's that yeah. Is, I know that'd be cool. And if you're all your, uh, uh, if you're all electric, it's even better. So, awesome! Thank you for going pursuing that. Was the solar? Where was the solar um, in the presentation? Was it part of it? Do no, we haven't put it. Is it part of this? It's going to be part of the building permit package, which goes to Washtenaw County. So it's not really a site plan approval. We don't have the interior um, MEP systems developed currently. Is my right? Yep. Kudos. We'll love to track it and um, shoot your horn if you become net zero. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I have a motion. Well, no, I have a question. question. Yep. I still have a motion. Okay. <laughs> um, I see that you have garbage dumpster. Um, do, you, do you have recycling? Are you going to have recycling picked up? The uh, our old provider, which was Advanced Disposal, was separating. It would would go to a MERV and separate it. They went out of business or sold out to uh, waste management. I don't know what waste management is doing with so it. So you yet. aren't separating it. Us. We don't separate it. No. Does our um, GSL you, yeah. do commercial? You you yeah. have yes, they have to do. set up. You have to you have to it's, but you have to pay for it. So, it, I guess what I think the point is, um, can can you agree on your site plan to 
provide space to do separate recycling and trash. It, I, I'm not sure if there's going to be enough to be able to recycle because they what they have now is they have pallets and they have just their office waste, you know. Yeah, we don't generate. I mean, it gets dumped. Well, maybe it's a cart. Yeah, it, it's it's not have, a whole lot. You so don't have packaging that you have to get rid of. Very little. Very little. It's mostly warehousing. I mean, we do have some cardboard um, that comes back um, from jobs, but not a lot. Like I said, I get dumped once a week. And it's a six yard dumpster. It's not like a big 40 or anything, you know. It's a, I mean, I, I think just having space to, so that you can do separate recycling. Yeah. I mean, realistically, what most we do with the cartons that come back is we offer those free of charge to people who then want to move. Uh -huh. So they're up, they, they come in and go right back out. <laughs> Even your papers. Mm -hmm. Paper does come. So, um, we can do that. You have a, Good. a motion contingent on providing space for recycling? Yes. Uh, okay. the, uh, based on the information received from the applicant and reflected in the minutes of this meeting and discussion herein, the Planning Commission finds that the site plan for Palmer Movie Ann Arbor Warehouse Building Edition SP <coughs> number 23004 meets the required standards and findings for the final site plan approval pursuant to section 36-180 of the zoning ordinance and recommends approval. The site plan is granted uh, with the following four conditions. One, concerns noted uh, in the township planner review dated 530, uh, 2023 be addressed to that the concerns noted in the township engineers review dated 426, 2023 be addressed Three, that the Planning Commission recommends that the applicant be permitted to have 29 parking spaces instead of the um, 29 Excuse spaces, me. 39 spaces required. otherwise required, provided that 11 spaces are, are uh, land banked. And four, the applicant agrees to work with a trash provider to maximize recycling efforts. Um, is that sufficient, Jen? No, provide or, or, and, it's, and to provide. It's just to provide, provide space. For and to provide space for recycling. Yeah. Okay. Can I, can I put? I heard reuse. So reuse. And recycling. Recycling and reuse. Yeah. Right. Recycling and reuse efforts, and to provide uh, re space. Therefore. Mm -hmm. Can I double check that? I wrote down a different in, uh, township engineers. Letter D. I had 426 uh, 23, but I refer to you. I have it in front of me the revision 426 23. Okay, yeah, the Thank final you. one. Thank you. Okay, support support by Commissioner Moore. Um, is there further discussion? All right, roll call vote. Okay, Commissioner Hyde. Yes, Commissioner Sharma. Yes, Commissioner Riser. Yes, Commissioner Chen. Yes, Commissioner Moore. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Yes. All right, Thank you. Thank you. There's a mirror walk. Sorry, you had to wait. Oh, no problem. Oh, no worries. You got to make it up All right. Uh, Turkey Run, new private road. Can you do this one? Okay. Um, welcome back. All right. We want to just highlight. Uh, yeah, I can give you a your quick, proposal. Yeah, I can give you a quick highlight. Um, I think you saw this project uh, about a month or so ago. I came through for rezoning. Um, so this is the land division proposal and private road uh, for Turkey Run. Um, it's currently a single family home on four and a half acres. Um, we're proposing to do a land division and split that property into two homes. 
uh, the existing home uh, staying in the rear, and then a new proposed home, uh, which is uh, closer to the roadway, but still buffering it with a pretty decent sized wetland between the home and West Del High Road. <coughs> we have our approval from the County Health Department for the drain field. And we've gone through engineering and planning review with just a few comments. We are providing um, first flush treatment of the storm water off the roadway as best we can in the area that we have. Um, and we are seeking a variance from the ZBA so we're on the agenda for on Thursday to get a variance from the wetland setback buffer. Um, we worked extensively with the fire department to create a road that actually skinnies up as you pull in, it goes from a full width road, skinnies down for a short section, then widens back up. Um, the fire department has approved that. We have an approved turnaround at the end. Um, so that um, shouldn't be an issue with the fire department. Um, the existing driveway is in this location now. And to go anywhere else on the property would create a large impact to the existing property. More so than the uh, offer that we're seeking a variance for at this time. Um, I will point out, and then, Doug, I don't know if you saw this on your review, but we do have a full tree survey. That's one of the items in your review letter um, on page two, page three. Um, we surveyed all of the trees on site including the DVH and health. And then on page four, we've listed all the trees that were going to be removed and provided our mitigation calculations there. Um, we currently have 191 trees on the property. Um, we have 41 of those trees set to be removed. Um, some of those are unregulated trees. So those 41, we have 38 regulated trees to be removed, um, which are 20% allowable removal is that 38 trees. So we have no mitigation on site, but yet we are proposing to plant um, 17. 17, yes, thank you, um, black uh, spruce trees. The black hill spruce, it is, but um, kind of help create a buffer between the two proposed lots. I think that's about the you know, rundown of it. Um, I'll leave it up to you for questions. On the plan, is there a um, a line that shows the 30 foot setback from the wetland? Yes. Yep. Which page is it on? So Sorry. It does show on page four. Um, you'll see the 30 foot wetland. So there's a dark line for the wetlands and then you know 30 foot. Oh, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a little more it. faint than yeah. yeah. And then you can see the roadway does get close to it. And 11 feet from it. Okay, what about the 30 foot? Um, I see the wetland boundary, but the 30 foot setback line. Oh, I see it. Yeah, if you go over by yeah, that really house. Yeah. Thank you. And yeah, you can see faintly the existing driveway too. Yes. Yeah. 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 Just a few things. So this is private road, <coughs> private road plan. Um, actually, this the provisions for this uh, the private road is not within the zoning ordinance. This is one of the township's annual ordinances. And planning commission has a role, but it's not an ordinance. And, and similar to site plan, you make a recommendation to the township board. Um, I don't have any comments on this. This is a um, pretty, pretty simple, I mean, it doesn't get much more simple than a, a fiber that is only accessing one additional home. Um, 
there's one item in the tree survey that, that um, I see it in the online plan. I think the plan should be at that page blank. I looked at it today and all we had was a calculation. So I think that's where that kind of came from. Oh, sorry. But I believe, you know, I see it here in the online plan. Um, and your calculation did indicate there was no tree mitigation required. We did see that, but if you're trying to, you know, bring that, you know, how, like determine how you came up with that. So I'm seeing that now. So I don't have any issues with the, the tree. Um, yeah, we'll of course check that again before it goes to township board, but I don't have any issue with that at this point. Um, probably the biggest issue, and then in the applicant will be requesting a variance that's actually on the Zoning Board of Appeals um, agenda, I believe, for Thursday. Yes. So if that is to be approved, we're really down to one item in, my, in our report, and that is uh, the, the, skinny, the skinning down of the road from 22 feet to 16 feet. Uh, causes a little bit of a problem uh, for calling this a class B road. Uh, because class B roads have to be 22 feet, the whole thing. No, you can't go 22, 16, 22. So I think we can I think we can address that by simply calling this a class C ramp. And really no issue with calling it a class C ramp. It can still be designed exactly the way it is now. It's just a class C private road. Um, and that would allow, in theory, that could allow us to the 16 foot because that's what the class C private road allows. But we understand that we want something a little wider for most of the drive, and that's fine. Uh, however, I think we if we approve it, if it, this motion goes on to, to rec for recommendation or approval, I think we have to call it a class C private road. Which is the consistent Of Call the class C. We would say class C as, or I guess the, the site plan takes care of that. We, you wouldn't have to reference. Yeah, but if you want, I, mean, I think I know we're going to say class C as presented. Yeah. Um, but that would address that. Um, get what they're doing, and uh, yeah, I have no other uh, issues. So, very simple project. Okay. Um, OHM. We also recommended approval of this one in our letter from May 26th. We had four minor comments. Um, I don't believe any of them should hold the applicant up tonight. I think they could all be addressed uh, before it goes to the board. And we actually included um, a requirement to see it again before going to the board to make sure that the comments are addressed. Um, the main one I think that I would point out is the frequency of maintenance being clarified in the private road declaration, but I believe that was included on the plans. Um, so kind of just making sure those match up, but otherwise pretty minor comments overall. Okay, thank you. One thing with regards to um, Stacy's review letter, she, she also had in here that we could make this a 33 foot wide easement. Um, we actually felt comfortable leaving it as a 66 foot wide easement because the road does meander through there. Um, and the small uh, four bay is actually within that easement as well. So that means that the homeowners both share in maintenance of the roadway and that um, four bay. So that was one thing we wanted to leave. As a 66 foot wide. She said you could go smaller. Yeah, we could go smaller. Yeah. Yeah, we just want to keep it clean. Yeah. I should clarify something as well. Uh, we noted that it was a class C private road, and I'm not sure if it did say class B on the plans and we overlooked that. That easement with, I believe, only applied if it was a class C. Uh, but if you were looking to keep it anyways, then that comment is essentially addressed. Yeah, our intent was to be a class C program. So I have one question, Doug, has this been vetted through our, has the uh, private road declaration been vetted through council? No, not yet. Okay, I'll make that a, I have a proposed motion that's gonna include that. Okay. At, at the a, appropriate time. Yeah, that's fine. Question. <laughs> I do have a question on the road declaration document. Item 11 on page four and then five. I'm, 
I'm a little confused by the wording, and it could be that I'm just not reading it right. But does, if any additional parcels, can you read that and see if it makes sense? I didn't bring that with me. Oh, so. if any additional parcel, parcels are created from the property, they will not have access to the private road, comma, each such parcel shall be bound by this agreement and will be deemed a parcel owner hereunder, and thereby permitted to cast a single vote per parcel and be responsible for a share of the costs for maintenance and improvements of the private road. So if they're not going to be, if they will not be have access to the private road, why would they have to pay? Well, it's to limit restriction from neighboring properties to connect to this. If any additional parcels that are created from the property. No, you were talking about from this, this property, property, I believe. That's how I'm reading it. So that's so I don't think you're going to have any additional parcels. So why is this future parcel statement in here? And if you are, why are you saying they won't have access to the road, but they have to maintain it? So I'm just your document, I just don't understand. Mm -hmm. Well, it's limiting any future development on the property. Basically, we're saying there's two lots there now. That's all that should be there in the future. That would be a simpler state. <laughs> so we can talk to the attorney about revising that then. <laughs> I have a, a couple, uh, just a, a question. The, I mean, the reason there's the buffer of 30 feet to a wetland is to protect the quality of the wetland. So can you talk about, um, you know, why you're, when you could do make everything 16 feet to limit impact and limit the variance. Um, it, uh, I also have, I'm the rep and zoning board of appeals and I think it's gonna to be tough because it's a self-created issue. And so the hardship, you know, of, but, you know, you're sort of creating your own issue. Um, so that uh, set that one aside just to prepare yourselves. But how how are you mitigating, you know, the um, the fact that you're so close to the wetland and the whole issue of the thirty the thirty foot setback is to um, protect it. Well, let me start by saying the existing driveway is in the thirty foot setback, um, so we really don't have much choice um, to put a driveway on this property. Um, we worked closely with the fire department in establishing the size of the roadway and their requirement was they, they do need to have two trucks to be able to pass on this roadway in order to properly service it with fire, which is one reason why we're at 22 foot um, and skinning down just in the area that we really had to. Um, yeah, a question for Doug then, if we allow a 16 foot class C road, yet the fire department yeah, wouldn't required. accept that? They could, you know, the fire, fire department does, does uh, well, we, we've approved 16 foot wide fire roads in the past. Is passing area regions? Not necessarily. I mean, uh, the fire department doesn't like them, they never have, but it's, it's allowed in our ordinance and they've accepted them. Even on other private roads that I've done, there's always been a bypass point mm -hmm. um, for trucks to pass each other on the roadway. It's, it's, it's a necessity for our fire. Well, I mean, not, not to get too much into the weeds, but if you're, a little background on our private road ordinance that went into effect, you know, in the 90s was um, that pre previous to the private road ordinance, we, we used to allow uh, what we call access strip forms of development. But we would have, instead of a private road, we would have two drivers running right next to each other, and you'd have this long skinny strip that would access that provide access to the public road, um, or allow a single easement. And that was really messy and didn't work, and it was problematic for fire uh, access. So we got rid of the whole access strip form of development and they adopted a private road ordinance. And to not make it too onerous on 
property owners, we came up with this class A, class B, class C scheme. The class C scheme, in essence, is a glorified driver. Mm -hmm. um, so, in this particular case, you have made for gravel, whatever, you know, for, for not a very substantial road because it was basically providing access to one additional home um, that would actually be. This new home is still going to have to use the entire road. The new home is going to actually use the shorter road. Mm -hmm. So going back to the mitigation, how can we mitigate yes. impacts on the wetlands? So what we'll do is for the CBA meeting, I'll have our landscape architect come in. Um, I know the wetland is heavily infested with buckthorn and a lot of invasive species. Um, the owner's already gone through a great expense and having a lot of that cleaned out. Um, if you haven't been by there lately, a lot of it's been now removed and cleaned out, and they're actually in the process of um, replanting some of that with more native species to keep those buckthorns out. Um, he can go into more details. I mean, that's not on the plan. That's just something that's happening on site to help mitigate that and protect that wetland in that area. So, do I hear you correctly that somewhat a lot currently in the driveway is there, it already has a negative impact on the wetland potentially? This won't make it better, but will it make it worse? Yeah, I guess that's, that's the question. And, and I think, yeah. Is there a fire department one in this? Uh, yeah, I think they're okay with it. I yeah, they're I know they're okay with it, but I don't understand the 22 foot at the, you know, where it seems like we could do a better job minimizing the impact. But do a better job of what? Minimizing the impact. Well, that puts them in a little bit of a trick bag, trying to accommodate the fire department and trying it to does. accommodate some on this commission. Who want them to narrow was there a reason did the fire department specifically request 22 feet at, at <clears throat> right where you turn in no well 22 foot where you come in is actually governed by the road commission well i meant like right rather than narrowing it down to 16 and then having you know further away from the wetland some sort of bypass i mean i suppose we could narrow it down a little bit sooner um i was just you know it's still going to impact it for a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. But it minimizes it. Yeah. Because I'd be interested in, in you know, up, up proofing it with a, um, to um, keep it at 16 feet for as, 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 um, as much as possible to minimize the additional impact on the wetland. What what's the fight? What's the chief going to say or the marshal going to say about that? Absolutely, they want to bypass one if there's a pumper truck and they have to get to the second house, or if there is you know the chance of cars coming by, <coughs> and you have only have two houses here. I mean, I don't want to go against, you know, fire department recommendations, but it just seems like, you know, right at the entryway, we could narrow it up. And that's yeah. where it's, you know. And there's about 75 feet of roadway we could skinny up. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is less impervious surface, more distance for, you know, um, water quality, you know, hitting the wetland. So to answer your question, and I, I guess we could make it contingent, you know, and, uh, you know, with the fire department and, and making it narrow. I'd prefer that just because I, I, I narrow it up if we can. So that would be my fourth uh, 
Okay. All right. Any other discussion? <coughs> We're ready for a motion. Uh, the, I would move that based upon the information received from the applicant and reflecting <coughs> the minutes of discussion of this meeting, the Planning Commission finds the private road plans received by the township meets the required standards of the private road ordinance and recommends approval of the <coughs> plan for a class C private road. Bob, uh, that's added in there for a class C <coughs> private road with the following conditions. One, that the concerns of the township planner be addressed. Two, that the concerns of the township engineer be addressed. Three, that the proposed private road declaration is subject to review and approval by the township attorney. And four, that the applicant work with the Sio Township Fire Department to uh, narrow the private road um, as, as much as possible or, or as, as private road, maybe I'll just leave it to narrow the private road period. Cause you know, the, it'll be up to you and the chief to decide how you get trucks through there. And you're talking about near the entrance to the road because that's where it- Yeah, narrow, yeah. I was gonna leave it to him and the fire department to figure yeah. out where to, how to- How to do it. That. I mean, I don't mind, but I didn't want to step on, the chief knows more about how well, those trucks need to get into wetlands. In that state, to, to, yeah, to narrow yeah. to protect the wetlands. Yeah, that's narrow mean, the private road so as to protect the wetlands. Mm -hmm. Then you don't have to talk about where; it's just what. I, I like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, is there support? Support. Okay. Support with Moore. Commissioner Moore. All right. Any further discussion? Roll call vote, please. Yes. 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 yeah, so if you wouldn't mind, give us a chance to revise the road declaration before you send it to the attorney. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, we have to. Yeah, okay. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. After you send it to him, too. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm not yeah. that That's okay. That's all y'all. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Lithia. Woohoo. We could do some calisthenics if you want. Yeah. You need more tables? You got a lot of people. We'll check it out to the end. Maybe it's after 11. Hey, I'm hey. going to adjourn. Wait, somebody's on Oregon time. Aren't you on Oregon time? Yeah, yeah. you're away. Right. You can do the presentation. You're in Michigan, so I have converted. <laughs> it is late. <laughs> Join our pain. <laughs> get to do it again tomorrow night. I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be tonight. Dang, you're right. I believe in that quarter, so you can do what you do on this. All right. Okay, let's go. All right. So, Lithia please introduce yourself and um, go ahead and, uh, if you haven't seen this since. Preliminary site plan. So, the updates. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jeff Huda with Noack and Frouse Engineering, and I'll be kind of kicking this off. Uh, we brought the project through the preliminary PUD uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, quite honestly. So, it's been a little bit of time. So, uh, with us uh, today, uh, we've got Ann Breck. Anne is the automotive design and compliance uh, person over at Lithia. Uh, Brian Danderan is the Lithia Automotive General Manager who is going to be operating this facility. Uh, Tyler Tennant is with us. He's the attorney with uh, Dada Man, uh, Mokehi, and Sadler uh, representing Lithia. Uh, Kurt Hansen is with Tally Construction Management. 
Uh, he's the construction manager for the project. Uh, Mike Cavanaugh is the regional VP um, for uh, Lithia Automotive. He'll be involved with the uh, strongly involved with the development of the project. Uh, we've got Shane Burley on the end. Uh, he's with Studio Detroit. He's our uh, architect uh, record on the project. And then uh, to my left, we've got Jason Longhurst and uh, Tim Wood. Uh, they've been dealing with a lot of the uh, intricate details associated with the site civil package that uh, you've received, the 93 sets of plans that you uh, I, I undoubtedly have gone through and uh, taken a, a really close look at. So um, we hope to be able to bring to you tonight a controversy-free project um, as we learn from the... <laughs> that, don't, don't jinx it. it. <laughs> Well, I think I, I say it with, uh, with some level of uh, background in the sense that uh, through the entire preliminary PUD process, uh, we had only had support from uh, residents within the area that came out for the project. Um, overall, um, it's been a very positive process and we look forward to uh, bringing this uh, through to a conclusion. I think uh, one of the things that resonates uh, with this particular project and listening to a lot of the discussion and dialogue tonight is you know, this is a development that's coming into your community. It's minimizing the impact uh, that uh, on infrastructure. We're actually reducing the REUs uh, that are uh, a part of the existing site versus what we're proposing. So again, a minimalized impact there. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that we felt was uh, very important in the preliminary PUD process was uh, I think that resonated with the Planning Commission was that you know, this is really a model development uh, for the region. Um, you know, speaking with Lithia, uh, the three, three, four hundred stores that they have, they have nothing like this that they developed. You know, um, as far as the, the intricate stormwater management strategies and some of the other aspects of the project that um, uh, we're uh, presenting to you tonight. So. Uh, we do hope that it is a catalyst for that region, um, and um, you, know, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, uh, moving forward, uh, you guys will uh, will agree. So, as far as an overall history, uh, just to be as brief as possible, uh, the Planning Commission. Um, I guess I should look at the slides. Um, so this is the site that we're looking at here. Um, it's between uh, Zeeb Road and Wagner Road on the, uh, the north side of the street there. So um, zoom in on the next slide. There's um, the uh, building that used to be there. Excuse me. Go back there. Yeah, there we go. Slow on the transitions. One A little sensitive on the buttons there. So uh, we're looking at uh, 18.14 acres um, on the north side of Z Road, Z Road, or on Jackson Road. We've got Delhi Road to the uh, to the east, and we'll be talking about that in a little bit uh, more greater detail as we go through the presentation. Um, overall project timeline: the PUD was approved um, in December of 2021 uh, by the Planning Commission. Uh, Township uh, Board of Trustees approved that uh, same uh, preliminary PUD uh, on uh, January of 2022. Uh, since then, we have secured uh, approval from MDOT, which was a very uh, key approval as far as stormwater management goes. Uh, we've also gotten approval from the Washtenaw County Water Resource Commission for stormwater. Uh, that approval was received in May. Uh, we also have the soil erosion control permit approved by uh, Washtenaw County uh, Water Resource Commission. Uh, we have uh, engineering approval uh, from OHM. Uh, that uh, letter was issued in May. And then we also have the uh, fire department approval, which is dated April of 2023. So very positive in the sense uh, that um, uh, everything was uh, seems to be moving along in a very positive way. So when we look at the, um, the original plan, um, I think that what we uh, presented and what I think we all agreed to uh, with the preliminary PUD was that um, our commitment to this project was providing development that had 35% open space where 30% was required as a part of the PUD. We've actually improved upon that as a part of the uh, revised submittal that you see tonight. 
Um, our public um, uh, contribution, because uh, I think that was a, a really big uh, um, discussion point today amongst other projects that you've seen, but also ours and uh, getting over that hurdle as far as the public benefit. Um, EV Park is a substantial, and I'm going to repeat that, very substantial feature uh, for this region. Um, that EV Park is estimated over a million dollars of investment uh, in infrastructure for the benefit of the community. Um, it is uh, something that is gaining a tremendous amount of traction in uh, the arenas that Lithia um, is, is within as far as interest, level of interest, how do we uh, capitalize globally uh, um, within the or regionally uh, on that investment. Um, our original commitment was for uh, six level three uh, solar charge, or charging stations. Uh, the uh, current plan that's before you today actually has 12 level three charging stations. Uh, so we've actually enhanced that significantly. And uh, we feel that that's uh, an important uh, addition to the, the community benefit. Uh, EV Park uh, has a uh, solar array that is actually contributing to the charging of those um, um, the vehicles. So there's a, 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 a story there to tell. Uh, in, in fact, there's an entire story to tell about everything that's going on on site. And uh, we are um, anxious to, uh, after, after we get to the construction and final uh, PUD approval tonight, um, you know, we, we are focusing on educational opportunities within the overall development, kind of a walking narrative of all of the things that we've accomplished uh, as a team and um, uh, let the public hear about uh, why these things are important. So um, we're still developing what that's going to look like. Might be some QR coding that uh, uh, dials back into some website designs. And I know you probably have seen a lot of those types of things at parks and things of that nature, but uh, I think there's a very significant story to be told as it relates to this particular uh, project. Uh, this project is uh, very pedestrian friendly, uh, non-motor, it's, it's uh, promoting extensively uh, non-motorized transportation within the region, uh, given a destination for people who are uh, using non-motorized transportation. Uh, an EV park is going to be Wi-Fi capable, um, so that uh, that's another added element to uh, what uh, uh, people using the park will be able to use it for. In addition to that, um, the old plan uh, had... Um, uh, what we called kind of an innovative stormwater management strategy, but quite honestly, through the design development process, and we hope that you would agree that when you look at the stormwater management plans that are presented in the package, I think we've taken it to another level. Uh, one of the words that we are kicking around as it relates to um, the, the landscape enhancements out here is it's, it's imaginative. It's not innovative. It's imaginative. It's something that uh, is not seen every day. Um, uh, we've never been a part of something that looks quite like um, this. And so it's really going to be a, um, a game changer, uh, we hope, for the community. Uh, the commitments also that we made were uh, uh, commitments towards uh, carbon neutrality, uh, energy efficient buildings, uh, promotion of electrification. And then we talked about that educational process. So um, those are our um, preliminary PUD commitments. Uh, we talked about the EV park, electrification, open space, sustainability, uh, naturalized stormwater management with enhanced landscaping, educational nature walk, carbon neutral footprint grow, and then the future outlet was uh, the other uh, piece that we came to terms with uh, in that preliminary PUD. Uh, this having to be a mixed use uh, development um, we still are looking to develop a partner for that. Uh, we understand that that's not going to be something that's going to be solved as a part of this final PUD process. And I think we all agreed as a part of that original process that we would reopen the PUD once a, uh, a partner uh, was identified as a part of that project. Is that instead of the park? No. no. Okay. I'm not talking about the EV park. I'm talking about the park. The yeah, no, we're right now, um, um, it's still intended on, you know, developing that parcel at some future point. Uh, we just don't know what that looks like yet. The outlet. The outlet parcel. Okay, correct. 
But you're still putting the park in community oh, yeah. park. park, no question about it. Now, I thought there was yeah. along the west side of the property you were going to do. There was like a long there was talk of yeah. linear piece of property. We talked about we converting. Park. We were talked about converting that whole piece into a park, but there was an interest on the part of the parks and recs folks here at the township to take over that as maintenance. They declined. Oh, well, I see. The township did. Okay. So that's what we're calling the outlet. Correct. Right. Okay. So project enhancements uh, since the preliminary POD approval. Um, so we uh, rearranged the dealerships uh, to accommodate construction phasing. So before uh, BMW was on the very western side of the site, Jag Land Rover was in the middle, and Mercedes Benz was on the east side. Uh, based on phasing, we know that um, Mercedes Benz and BMW are going to go first in the construction phase. We didn't want to have a construction project in the middle of those dealerships. So we swapped the uh, Jag Land Rover and the uh, BMW store so that Jag Land Rover is really on the, the west side of the site. It just better accommodates the overall uh, uh, project phasing. Uh, we've actually your Jag Land Rover for sure going to be in there? Jag Land Rover right now, um, and, and can jump in on this, but what we've, what we've learned is, is that Jag, Jag Land Rover has put a halt to uh, development across the country right now because they are revamping their imagery and design standards. So we fully expect that they will be on board. Um, we, that's why they are on a second phase to this. We just think that that's probably going to lag behind by six months to a year before we can get those standards. But that's that's the best information that we have right now. So I sort of say unnamed, but it's really, you're not naming it, but you know who it is. Yeah. We expect it fully we to be. Yeah. That's our expectation, but it's actually the design process for that <clears throat> OEM has been on hold since April of 21. Yeah, I, I, yeah we can't design something that we don't have direction on. And we thought it was unfair to present images and things of that dealership when clearly there's an understanding that they're revamping that program. So as soon as we have that data and information, but whatever that uh, ends up being, it will be a high-end dealer uh, consistent with you know uh, that type of uh, development. So we've increased the open space. You'll see that a little bit later on. We've gone from 35 to 37%. Uh, we did eliminate the pervious pavers, and uh, we know that that was an issue that was raised by uh, Doug's uh, review letter. It's really just based on soil conditions. Uh, we sat out there with the uh, Washtenaw uh, County uh, Drink Water Resource Commission. We did all of the soil borings out there. We took all the perp tests, uh, water infiltration testing, and um, it just does not promote the ability to have pervious pavers on the site. So the strategy shifted to uh, more of a, um, if you look at, and we'll see it, uh, the, um, the northernmost, um, we call it kind of a uh, detention area, is now more of an enhanced bioswale. We wanted to promote the groundwater filtration and things of that nature. So. Uh, that facility, rather than being a hole in the ground, is I think what we originally were planning, is really a, an enhanced bioswale treatment system. It's going to be very well landscaped, and we 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 felt that that was a comparable uh, uh, change in in how we were handling that. Uh, there's been a refinement in the EV park as far as the overall uh, development of that goes. And then uh, we talked about the addition of uh, educational and wayfinding amenities that will be incorporated as a part of the project. So this is the uh, current plan. I, I think if you were to uh, take an objective look at it, it looks really, really similar to the plan that was approved as a part of the PUD, even though we swapped some of the uh, uh, dealerships around. The uh, setbacks uh, have not changed uh, from the original uh, plan. Uh, you can see the uh, what I was mentioning on the northern basin there, um, the, the the rock um, uh, swales that we've got with some check dams and creating little nodes of of how the water is going to uh, infiltrate. 
Uh, one of the major challenges of the site was just grading. I think it came out in the PUD process. We have 32 feet of grade change from one side of the site to the other. So you just can't drop a detention basin in the middle of it and you know, get all of that to work. So um, uh, how the uh, stormwater management uh, strategy really unfolded uh, really is gonna be dynamic uh, when you take a look at it out there. I'm a little confused. Uh, which dealerships are these ones now, left or right? Yeah, so um, uh, Close, closest to you would be the Mercedes <coughs> dealership, then the BMW, and then the proposed Jaguar Land Rover. Okay. And where's the EV park? Um, it is. Where the cars can play on swings. Right there, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's charging and just green space? And it's, yeah, a park you could. No, there's benches, there's benches. picnic tables, there's you um, walk your way through that. Yep, solar arrays uh, for the, uh, the charging stations. I think the the, the intent of it, and um, I, I can't remember if you were on the township board when we uh, looked at the uh, did the final PUD approval, but uh, the whole intent is making this a, a potential destination spot. You know, you're going to grab a sandwich down the road. Where do you go if you've got an electric vehicle? You're able to come to EV Park, uh, park your car. Where's the outlet? Outlet is on the very uh, west side of the site. Is that an outlet? That's not an outlet. Like I think of an outlot where you put a restaurant or you put something like a drive to or right? Is that just a, or is that an outlet like that? It is an outlet like that. It's for future development. Okay. It's just not defined right now what that is. There's some challenges to that piece. So do you have a do you have in mind the kind of things you want? Because it is part of this PUD. Yeah, that was spelled out in the PUD. Yeah, we we invited the township to identify the uses that you did not want to see on there. Yeah, we were focusing on the things that you do not want to see on that. Okay. Mini storage. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, no. Right, no, exactly. No, 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 those are the things in the PUD that were that you don't want there. Yeah, yeah. No helipads. And I believe that's well, what, was that an acre that outlet? Uh, it's a two and a half. Yeah, it's two, two and, and a half acres. Yeah. Okay. Good question. What's that in the back there? On the right top? The top left? Uh, top, top. The uh, trees in the freeway? Still water. Yeah, exactly where it goes through, right? Yeah, that's that's our stormwater management. Uh, th that's a bioswale. So uh, that has that particular area there has six separate zones that has water cascading through it during a rain event. So a grade is falling from right to left. And in the upper basin, you've got uh, connections to the parking lot that drain into that. The water is filtered within those uh, that area, and then that is all connected to an underground detention area, which is that underneath the parking lot, which ultimately ties into the above grade detention area or retention area um, in, in that area. That's now, the low point? That's the low point. That's where historically all the water has been going from, uh, goes, actually discharges into I-94. We've uh, received approval from out for this design, no issues from their perspective. And um, the, the basin on the uh, upper left there, that's actually an infiltration basin. We did have soils there that infiltrated. So uh, there's calculations associated with water infiltrating into that facility. Um, and uh, so we're making the best use of the perkable soils that we do have on the site. Mercedes is right now at the back, right? The Mercedes dealership right at, at, at the bridge. Yeah, 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 in, in the, the back. Yeah. Okay. It's like on yeah. Uh, it's it's east. Okay. Next slide. So this is the open space plan. Um, the uh, PUD, preliminary PUD, had it at 53.13%. We're at 37.72% now. So um, I think some of that is actually from, there's a couple of islands that maybe have, were those large green islands, which are on the, the very left, uh, were uh, potentially left off the calculation. But uh, those are clearly large open areas, uh, picnic tables, things that could be used uh, as a part of the development. Next slide. 
So, you know, this is um, some pictorial representation of what we believe the stormwater management facility is going to look like. Um, you know, kind of a cascading effect to it with uh, riprap, natural stone boulders, uh, native landscape plantings that are flanking each side of it. You know, something that as you're walking through there, because we've got a, a sidewalk that's circumventing all of that, that really gives you a lot of interest uh, as you're um, navigating uh, that area. And as I said before, just a tremendous amount of educational opportunity. So, um, uh, the uh, oversized infiltration along uh, I-94 uh, will uh, be there also to, to recharge uh, groundwater uh, as much as possible. So um, I think um, hopefully you agree uh, this, the stormwater management strategy for this site is, is very unique and dynamic for uh, what we've seen uh, within the community. Next slide. You're gonna have to put up with people coming in and say so. Well, as long as they're buying cars. We're good. That's what we want them to do. Yes. <laughs> so uh, part of the underground detention uh, areas are actually, um, they're open bottom. Uh, so that when we, we call out underground detention, they are the open bottom type so that anywhere that we can promote groundwater infiltration, it will. Uh, but everything does eventually evolve into connecting into an enclosed system. Next slide. So as far as uh, sustainability uh, planning, we, we know that um, sustainability is really um, important uh, to the community. Um, and, and we believe that we've met the targeted goals that have been established for this project. Uh, we've got uh, bike parking for 12 bikes. Uh, we've got 12 charging stations, which is uh, double what we were originally proposing there. Um, native landscaping with tree canopies as a part of the overall development, uh, the innovative stormwater management uh, strategy with bioswales. Uh, uh, solar is uh, uh, used as uh, the primary use for electrical vehicle chargers. So it's kind of an interesting education opportunity there when they you see the solar arrays and they're charging their vehicles and making that connection. I think one of the things that we talked about extensively during the uh, development preliminary QD process was range anxiety and um, trying to get people to overcome that. And this is going to go a long way to helping that. Uh, we've met all of the Jackson Road uh, corridor overlay district requirements as a part of the overall project. And um, our development is um, with a carbon neutral energy focus um, uh, was at the forefront of the design process. Can I ask you about that? Yeah. So, you could go back to that last. So the carbon neutral energy focus, does that mean that you're using solar in your buildings as well, not just the EV park? I'll let uh, our architect handle all of that. Uh, so with regard to the uh, solar capacity, really that's primarily driving the chargers. We are doing 100% um, electric buildings supplemented and um, with the Michigan Green Power Program. So 100% of our energy will come from renewable resources. And I'll dive into more. We have some EUI targets and findings once we get to those slides. When you use solar for charging, does that involve battery storage as part of the units? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Uh, talked about community benefits briefly, uh, but we've got um, the park design for EV park, uh, development of EV park for use by the public. Uh, we've increased from six to 12 level three charging stations. We've got the solar canopy uh, carports uh, and we've got the pedestrian bicycle amenities for visitors. As far as site designs, preservation and perpetuity of 37% of open space, the imaginative landscaping and the enhanced stormwater management. Uh, as far as building uh, design, we've got the energy efficient buildings, energy efficient LED lighting, and other aspects of the building design itself. And then I've uh, got a footnote on here just a, um, to, to revisit that, just a reduction in the REU uh, calculations for the site in comparison to what the existing uh, conditions were. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Shane and he's gonna talk about building architecture. Thanks, Jeff. 
Uh, starting on the right hand side, each side, again, we have Mercedes. Uh, middle development is BMW, and then the future JLR on the left side. Next slide. So these buildings, I mean, you know, we heard you and we accepted your carbon neutral challenge, I will say. And uh, the design of these is really an energy use driven approach. Um, we actually utilized, uh, you know, EUI metrics, uh, energy use uh, intensity, I believe is the acronym. And from there, we established a baseline. Now, for each of uh, BMW and uh, Mercedes, we prepared energy modeling of the entire structure, the entire building, all systems, loads, whatnot, that goes into a lengthy computer program to really dial in those metrics. So you compare that to a baseline model, right? We actually went one step further and we're using ASHRAE 90.1 version 2019 versus uh, the current code version, which is 2013. So, you know, we took that to the next level as well. I would say, you know, based on our findings in the calcs and, you know, being a 100% electric building, we have an EUI target baseline for both projects of uh, 55. Uh, our performance on Mercedes came in at 45.2. And our performance for BMW came in at 53.4. And th they vary due to the size of the buildings. Uh, Mercedes is a two-story larger structure. Uh, BMW is slightly smaller, so that's why you're seeing these variations in those readings. I would also like to add, you know, that's 17.8% better than the baseline for Mercedes. And it's also 8.3% better than ASHRAE 90.1 2019. So, I mean, like I said, we really took your challenge, you know, accepted it and pushed our engineering team to see what they can do. You know, to that end, it's an all electric heat pump HVAC system. Uh, we're using variable speed ECM exhaust fans. You know, we have multi-stage heating and cooling. So these things could dial up, dial down and really respond to what these buildings need. Uh, we have ultra low leakage economizers. You know, when we have the opportunity on a nice 55, 60 degree day, maybe we can pull some of that outside air and reuse that. We have a high efficacy LED lighting. You know, the light fixtures that we expect exceed 100 lumens per watt. So we're really getting that watt to really drive a lot of lumens. Uh, we also are implementing a combination wired and wireless network lighting control. So all our site lighting would be able to be dimmable, controlled. Uh, you know, we can dial it down at night but if somebody arrives on site for security and safety reasons, you know, these zones can come back up. You know, obviously expensive brands, expensive cars, we don't want any mischief. Um, we also have a, a building automation and control system. You know, with all this technology, the electrical, the uh, wireless, lean the management system to kind of display those metrics to understand, you know, when to turn the lights on and off, how, you know, how much energy are we actually saving with the use of electricity? Um, again, you know, I know the, the solar canopies, you know, in order to do a, an installation that would supply enough power for all these EV chargers, this would be a large installation. So what we propose as a project team is, like I said, 100% of our power will be purchased through Michigan Green Power Program, or DTE. And that's power coming straight from renewables be it wind, solar, uh, whatever else DT offers. But it doesn't stop at energy. You know, we're, we're taking a look at materials within the buildings. You know, high performance solar control blazing systems. I mean, we're, we're trying to find um, glass systems that have U values in the 0.24 for assembly. What value? 0.24. What value is that again? Uh, that's a U value. It has to do with the insulation capacity of the glass. So there's products, newer products that use like triple glaze, or not triple glaze, sorry, but triple silver films that really lower those U values. And the lower the U value, the better. You know, most of our commercial projects we're seeing around a 0.32, maybe 0.3, somewhere in there. 
But SolarVan makes a product, SolarVan 72, that we can get down to 0.24 winter U value. Um, high SRI roofing, you know, white roofs reflect that heat back, you know, so it doesn't sit there on that building and create additional energy load and additional energy demand. Water conservation, I mean, low flow plumbing fixtures. But we also have a car wash. You know, we're recycling our water from that car wash, reclaiming that, reusing that in that system. And lastly, I just want to add, you know, challenge accepted, but we think that this could be a benchmark for future dealerships, future commercial projects within the township to really, you know, say, hey, what is possible? What's not possible? I mean, there's give and take between those two things, but you know, we can strive to, to do it. And, uh, you know, thank you for the challenge, I guess. But I'd also, you know, not only are we doing electrical, you know, buildings, but we want to sell electric cars, you know, both BMW and Mercedes. They're like, they're moving into that electric, electrical vehicle manufacturing. That's the next wave, you know. How are we going to do this as a society? What does it mean to have electric cars? But not only that, I mean, we offer, you know, 12 level charger, level three chargers that you could charge your car in 30 minutes. Under an hour, basically from, uh, you know, zero up to maybe 80%. So yeah, you can come off the highway, right? Come in, sign up, sit there, plug in, hour done, charge, walk the park. So, you know, really that's what I had to add about the electric vehicle and the, you know, carbon neutral, trying to be carbon neutral. As you can see here, which I'm just going to go through some quick slides of, you know, the updated renderings, images, uh, Jackson Road for your references on the left side of the slide. Uh, you can see the two solar canopies. We split the, um, the EV charges into two portions. Is that where the EV charge is going to be? Yeah, underneath? underneath those two canopies there. And how many is it going to hold? Maybe you said it. Twelve. Six each Six side. Six. Six each side, level three. And if you think of you know the, the power requirements for level three, I mean you could be in three to four hundred amps each. There's a lot of power going to these chargers. And then we, you know, working with the landscape, developed this meandering path and you know provided some benching, seating, the fixturing and display, and other site amenities. Is there Wi-Fi or no? Yep. Yeah. And charging becomes faster and faster, which it will in the very near future, how does this model, I'm asking a very, I mean, I mean, I mean don't you, you do realize, right, charging will become very fast, very soon, very quickly. It already has, so. It already has, and it's good to pick up speed or whatever, more slow, whatever they have. So uh, all these people sitting around, will not be sitting around anymore. I mean, again, I don't want me to throw a monkey wrench here, but I was just wondering, I mean, why would I sit? Like, actually, I don't sit in a gas station, do I? And nor will I sit here going forward. And the charging stations are going to be very fast, very powerful, very soon. There's no doubt about that. So these are state of the art charging stations that we're putting in. And today, uh, a level three will take you about 30 minutes to get into a full charge. And um, we have a national partnership with ChargePoint, and they truly believe that right now, this technology is probably the technology that you'll see for the next five to 10 years, that it's not going to get a whole lot faster than 30 minutes. Because what you have to remember is the infrastructure that's out there to support the power that comes to those charges. There's only so much infrastructure to get the power to the charger. It can't make them any faster. We're already, you know, in some, some places, we have to upsize our transformers in our dealerships because we can't get enough power to those chargers. So, you know, we, we've had a lot of conversations about our EV chargers going to become like our laptops were in the early 90s, that as fast as we bought a laptop, the next one was coming out. And we feel confident that um, ChargePoint has developed a charger. We're using a uh, power block system, so it will hold some power in the power block for these chargers. So basically, you're saying that, uh, again, 
don't mean to. I'm not saying that you're wrong by any no, means. I'm not saying anything. I'm just a uh, uh, basic. So that's interesting. You're saying this technology is going to stay this way for the next five to ten. Ten, ten, ten years. Ten, that's a long time. I'm very surprised to hear that. But again, uh, that, that's my idea on this. Yeah. Okay. Please continue. Sorry. So where are the power lines mounted? Now they're, they're actually going to be sort of they're not in the rendering they'll they'll be um in a in a enclosed space you the you wouldn't see them in you won't see them in the park we're going to have to put like a some very attractive fencing around them to 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 to, to, to kind of disguise them a little bit there's a question about the EV chargers um so there'd be a cost to the person sure. charging. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the average cost is to charge yeah, within 30 minutes? Okay, I'm just curious. You do that as a money maker to you guys or because we're making you do it? Um, I, I think the industry is changing and, and we want to make sure that we have the resources for customers to be able to charge their vehicles. Um, this was actually, I mean, we we knew with our PUD we had to have a community benefit, but this was really Lithia came to you with our EV um, charging park. So I would say this has been our idea to kind of promote this EV charging and come up with a, a green space. <clears throat> Um, just because we know right now it does take a little while to charge your electric vehicle. It's not like going to the gas station and 10 minutes later, you're on your way. So is it going to be 24 um, seven? We haven't gotten that far into whether the dealership, whether we, the, the, the dealership is a public place. So I, I assume someone could come up that the chargers would work. You could put your credit card in and charge your car. So would you say, I think it was fair to say that the township wanted EV charging, but the EV park was your idea. And maybe that's, that's true. It's been, a, it's been a year and a half since we've been here. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe it was a collaboration. How about we sure. call it that? Can you say there'll be wayfinding uh, or software that people can app that people can find these stations? Is that how it Oh works? yeah, we are on a national network with charge points. So you would be able to go on an app and find these without any problem. Do you need any signage? I didn't see any signage in the plan. I, I pretty much, I mean, I don't the think- cars find them. If it's in the app, you're gonna find it. You're gonna find it. Where we were talking about wayfinding signage was more about the, the, the plantings and the bioswales and how those things are, are sort of the sustainability pieces. And that story was how we were weaving the story as you were walking through the, the parks. But for the EV chargers, they're pretty much in your face. You're gonna find them. Figuring like when you you drive down the expressway right now, you've got the little signs that says McDonald's and we're gonna have a placard eventually that says electric charging stations. This no, exit. It's all on the phone. Oh, you can't hold your phone anymore though. No, that's right. No, it's a passenger car. Yeah. But no, it's the EV car. The, car. the screen will show you that. Actually, the screen, yeah, they show yeah, the EV car, the screen will show you where the charging stations are. Yeah, finding it won't be a problem. Yeah. That's not a problem. The autonomous car will take you there. You can just sleep. <laughs> no. It's already here. <laughs> are we going to get a motion to approve this, or are we going to move on? Because it's trouble. I know. Exactly. Yeah. I agree with you. I will call it at 7 o'clock with India. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's time to go home. No. Go ahead. We're a little punchy. Just go through some quick images. Just keep going. We had more views of that. Path through the park. <laughs> yeah, as you work out the the landscaping too, I would encourage some. Uh, it doesn't look like it's very well shaded, but just think about you. You've got a lot of heat island there with the asphalt and and so forth. I think um, you know making sure you have some good shade trees in that park. Um, 
Okay, I good. Those two, yeah, I think it's, it's kind of hard with the renderings to show yeah, anything yeah, accurately, but it shows that, that in the rendering. Yep. We actually and, had to move one of the solar canopies because the tree was going to yeah, block it. So <laughs> they're there, I promise you. And again, I just want to you know reiterate these buildings are of high quality and finishes. You know, this is ACM, this is glass curtain wall. You know, nice materials, quality materials that I think really, you know, enhance that overall aesthetic. Why did one of those Pardon? Can you go back one? The Mercedes is the car one. Yeah, Mercedes is on the right. There's a lot of roof units in the, on the BMW one there. Well, I'll have to yell at my rendering people to you know add some more rooftop units. <laughs> and you can see they have the parapets uh, yeah. around. For well, actually, we, we did study you know how far set back they are relative to that roof edge. And, you know, these are tall buildings as well. So I, you know, in our packet, we have some sight lines. You can't see the RTUs. Yeah. And going back to the HVAC, you said minimal use of gas. So you are using a little bit of gas? We have uh, like a couple tube heaters, uh, some infrared tube heaters at our overhead door location. Mm -hmm. And that's just to help with um, uh, kind of with the heat, just making you know, that you don't have too much heat loss at the doors. But there's a reason why you have the number of trees per parking space so that you can provide shade to the parking lot, not just to the grass. So just uh, diving back in, uh, Eagle Part 41 permit has been applied for, uh, Act 399 permit for water main extension has been applied for, uh, MPDS permit has to be applied for by the contractor once they're on board. So those permits and approvals are, are imminent. Um, easement documentation uh, will be prepared and provided to the township engineer for, for approval at the appropriate time. Um, Washington County Road Commission right of way. Um, they've been engaged in this process uh, since 2021 uh, with the preliminary PUD approval. Uh, they have provided us comments in the past with respect to the development. Um, the traffic study, we did a traffic study of part of the preliminary PUD. Uh, that traffic study required us to put the acceleration lane and the acceleration tapers uh, going into the approaches. Those are identified on the plans. So no, uh, no, nothing changes there. But what the road commission has come back to us with is that your traffic counts are now out of date. So they've asked us to just update the traffic counts, update the traffic report, and then resubmit that for approval work. We've already done the updated traffic counts. They've, they've changed negligibly. Uh, we do not expect any issues at all from the road commission, but clearly whatever the road commission needs, uh, we'll provide. Uh, but we know that that's an outstanding issue as a part of what we're talking about tonight. Um, and then uh, the Dell High Road to vacation, we know that that is also an outstanding issue uh, with respect to this package. We feel that both of these issues are issues that hopefully you guys would see your way uh, uh, to uh, doing a conditional approval to the township board and we'll resolve those before we go to township board. Uh, as it relates to Dell High Road, uh, we've submitted actually dual applications. Uh, one is to vacate the right of way. Uh, that is our desire. Uh, that uh, is, we want the uh, Dell High Road improvement to be a part of our development. Um, and, uh, but we do have one of the property owners um, on Dell High Road as objected to it, uh, the road commission's taking that up next week. Uh, we've had a uh, public comment uh, about three weeks ago, and then we've got another meeting in uh, July for the final. July eighteenth for the final, and in the meantime, the road commission has is preparing the public road improvement application for us. So we're we're actually with them. We're taking parallel paths. It's either going to be one or the other. Uh, if it goes uh, as a vacation, the plan, as you see, is exactly what you're going to get. If it goes to a public road improvement, 
uh, very slight changes, the roadway width changes by a foot. And then we'll probably end up having to put a cul-de-sac at the end of the road, which really has no impact to the plan as it being presented tonight, other than it's a change in, in how that road's gonna look. The, the cul-de-sac will stay within the right of way of, of Del High Road. Is there only one other user of Del High Road of that road right now? There's two. There's two. two. There's, There's one in the front. Yeah, I believe that's MEM is the landowner, and then the Michigan Credit Union is the has at the back they have, and we've been working with the credit union, and they've been very cooperative. We're having. Um, some pushback from the front property owner. So that'll be resolved with the road commission. Um, I, I just, I don't think it really impacts the decision tonight as it relates to what we're proposing. Uh, and then uh, going through quickly the uh, review letter by uh, Mr. Luan, um, we understand and no, no issues with the combination of parcels. We, we can't move forward with that land combination until we resolve what's happening with the uh, road right-of-way uh, dedication. Because if we, we do all the combinations, is the right-of-way in or out? So uh, that will follow up in due time. And it's a, a, something that's uh, very easily handled. Uh, we did, uh, uh, in Mr. Lewan's letter um, was, uh, had an extensive narrative regarding uh, tree replacements. Um, well, we're before you tonight. Um, we, uh, I think we've come to a conclusion with uh, Mr. Luan's office that uh, right now there's 323 replacement trees that are required that we cannot fit on site. Just not enough areas to plant that landscaping. So the commitment tonight is to uh, make a contribution to your tree fund to resolve that, uh, that issue. Um, the uh, right of way and silver maple trees uh, have been accounted for in those revised calculations uh, that were worked out with uh, uh, Mr. Luan's office. Uh, and we talked about the updated traffic impact study um, that'll be submitted to uh, the road commission on uh, the 16th. Uh, that's when that's due back from our consultant. Uh, all landscaping quantities have been coordinated uh, and will be on the revised plan that goes to the township board and uh, requesting landscape alternatives, waivers for green belt trees, foundation plantings. I think the plans were pretty clear on what that looked like as far as uh, where we could put foundation plantings and how that was being handled on site. So we do believe that that has been uh, adequately addressed. Uh, we believe the um, <coughs> photometric plan uh, was uh, updated and we are uh, adhering to the 0.3 foot candle requirement. Uh, the third monument sign is something that is needed. Uh, we believe it's a part of the PUD uh, agreement that's been presented to the township. Uh, so um, that would be one monument sign per dealership. And then uh, the BMW sign calculation table has been revised on the revised plan. So I think that has been addressed and um, that'll be on the plans that go to the township board. And then um, we'll continue to work with the township staff to finalize uh, the development agreement prior to the township board consideration. Uh, I know that we just received comments back from the township attorney on that. So we're just working through um, the finer points of the uh, overall uh, PUD agreement. And once that's resolved, then we'll be back to the township board. So for us, I, we think that it, it just boils down to a couple of issues, we, we think. Uh, maybe you have more, hopefully not, but we'll see. Uh, but I think the idea is uh, we, we, we've tried to mitigate all of this. It's been a very long process. Uh, it's a very challenging site, very challenging design. Hopefully you appreciate um, where it's come from uh, the vision that we had a year and a half ago and being able to prove that out in the presentation tonight. So with that, turn it over for any other questions. Questions of the applicant or shall we just go to, uh, can you kind of hop through, just maybe confirm that what they said has been taken right. care of, has been any <clears throat> um, yeah, they, they, their office has been working. Our comments <clears throat> were primarily uh, three count comments that we, you know, we pointed 
wall, and um, the applicant has been cooperative and willing to calculate the trade flow that we you know, that we believe they should be calculated, uh, which required some additional uh, tree plant, you know, replacement tree on site. I think that's addressed. I think one of the things that so yeah, the landscaping we, we will recheck that as well as the report. But it sounds like they're willing to work with us on those comments. The one thing that the planning commission would have to do tonight is is uh, agree to the PUD waivers for the greenbelt plantings, uh, and that's that has to do partly with the Delhi Road. If the Delhi Road is not uh, vacated. Then they'll have to provide full green belt plantings on Delhi Road because it's a public road. It's vacated, it just becomes part of the property, and then they wouldn't have to do that. Um, but so that so they're they're asking for some waivers from that, from the green belt plantings on Delhi Road, as well as uh, some parking lot screening requirements that uh, for this parking that faces uh, Jackson. And uh, parking lot screening, what some parking lot parking lot screening to plant less trees, right? Yeah, it's in shrub, most most like a three foot shrub edge because they say that we already require some plantings along Jackson. So, is that part of the public benefit to do less for the environment? It's 12 15, and I'm a little cranky. Yeah, <laughs> well, don't slow down then. Yeah, okay, I appreciate your point, Bob. My, my apologies. Um, so anyway, that, that, that's what. Part of what we're requesting is a waiver for uh, some of the landscape requirements. And Kathy can go into more detail on that. But aside from those waivers, and that's something that the Planning Commission and the Ultimate and Township Board would have to agree to like, put into the PD. If you want to do that, there's no requirement that you do that. Um, it sounds like the applicant has uh, either made changes and or is willing to calculate I do have a question about the greenbelt planting. Um, is that for parking lot headlight screening from shining onto yeah, the roads? Yeah. So, I mean, what's going to keep, I mean, if we waive the need to put that in there, is there something that takes its place? You want to address the waiver? Well, we don't have Specifically on Delhi, Delhi Road is going to be about five or six feet higher than the parking lot. So all of our, our parking lot that is abutting Delhi is going to be below road grade. There's going to be a landscape berm in between the two with a pretty substantial differential down to it. And we're only talking about along East Delhi. Right. Anyway, not Jackson Road. We're not the, in Jackson Road. I think we can go back to the, the rendering, but there is a very substantial landscape plan. We're not, we're not asking for waivers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. The, so no, just the wa the waivers only along Delhi and the waiver is only if you end up not vacating it. Is that correct? You don't need a waiver if, if it's if it's vacated because it's the right. private road parking lot. So, so, yeah, so the one the perimeter parking lot landscape, the parking lot is visible from public road required to be screened from view with the landscape burn very in height from two to three feet on the perimeter of those sites, which are visible and shall be planted with a minimum one tree and six shrubs per 31 feet. No perimeter parking lot landscaping is proposed. The applicant has requested that the following waiver with regard to perimeter parking lot trees, the area along Jackson Road, which is but which is but the parking, each have portions of underground retention systems directly by the curb. This is really an illicitly plant in addition to front of Green belt is substantial and will be more than and will more than screen vehicles from the road. Similar to the Del Harbor from which is hedge and no more real plantings. So this is not just Delhi, they're actually they're actually asking for jacks. And you're saying that the plantings, the water detention basin plantings are yeah. are sufficient. Correct. Yeah, and I think so, there, there's areas where where the plantings couldn't be because of the tension, they were just moved to other areas. Are, what you, are you saying that the numbers are on the site? You're supplying same the same amount, but it's just not 
because you're doing more grasses. Yeah, and it, it got very complicated. And that was one of the comments from, from Carlisle Wortman was to identify which plantings were uh, adhering to which requirement because they are all spread out around. So our landscape architect came up with a kind of a key designation for foundation plantings and greenbelt plantings and, and parking lot plantings. And they're all noted on the plan so that we could clarify for, for Carla Wortman how we were meeting all of those requirements and where they were, especially in those areas where we had to take plantings from where we couldn't put them and move them elsewhere. So the issue is really either there's a little bit with the trees, right? Because you can't put all the trees in the site, but you've accounted for the trees that are supposed to be along oh, Jackson yeah, Road the, that the, can't be along The Jackson trees Road that were Road. mitigating are trees that were taken down right. and required replacements. We've, we've met all of the requirements for parking lot landscaping and things like that. But the, in addition to all of that, there was another, I think it was 700 some trees that we needed to mitigate. We were able to take care of 350 or so, we need to mitigate 323. But I think what she's asking Jason is that we have the required number of like landscape trees per the ordinance. They might not be exactly where the ordinance calls Correct. for them to be. Correct. Yep. So the waiver is really for location, not number, but not number. That, but that I believe the waiver on Delhi Road is both location and number. Yeah, and, and the write up um, that they've got in the report goes into that. It just um, indicates that the area is currently heavily planted with parking lot trees, wooden replacement trees. Um, no additional trees were provided. The required shrub plantings have been provided along the east and west frontages to screen the parking lot. And that we're just requesting a, a waiver from those, you know, the tree requirements. And so again, it's all of the pieces have been kind of moved around to where they fit best on the site. You just said the same thing over again. So we get that, but we're just trying to figure out what the waiver is. So the waiver for the parking lot screening is just a matter of location, not the number of shrubs or trees. For the Jackson Road, but not, it is a waiver for the Delhi, correct? For the number, number and location. The Delhi. Yeah, it's so going, going back to the right. Again, the number is shown in Jackson. My concern on Jackson Road is that the plantings that are supposed to screen the parking lot have like Oh, maybe that's not public. public. Oh, they're they're display parking. So all in front of those bioswells, that's I mean, all display will. parking. So they don't start up very often. I mean, they start up, but you don't have pulling in and out. Right. Okay. So the yeah, the customer parking actually where you would have the pulling in and out actually pulls in towards the, the buildings. Yeah, so I'm just looking at the Jackson Road calculations. We're required 41 trees, we're providing 41. We're required 245 shrubs, we're providing 245 shrubs. The, the numbers The number's are, fine for Jackson it's Road. Just the it's just the location. Just the location. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then it's then it's um, the waiver of numbers for it's a, a full waiver for Delhi. Right. Is that correct? studying those numbers. Yeah. Um, we just need to make sure that the right waivers apply depending on what the road commission. And we, the verbiage we put in our presentation was right from the, um, the recommendation section of the report. So that uh, item number, it's item number seven, it's just to consider the landscape alternative slash waivers requested for green belt trees, foundation plantings, and perimeter parking lot landscaping. Well, yeah, that's pretty vague for our purposes. But yeah, but I think we can we can do because the Delhi waiver is only if it's not vacated, right. and it's a full waiver for 
um, screening and trees. And then the other one is just for Wave Road location, the Jackson Road. Does that make sense? I'm going to call on you when you mm -hmm. make your. And, then, and we'll have to have Carla right. Wardman. It's actually the perimeter parking lot landscaping. It's a separate landscaping standard in addition to the green belt. That's at the bottom of page nine. There's, so there's a there is a there's a green belt requirement on Jackson. Yeah. And then there's also a perimeter, whatever parking space is facing a public road, there's also a permanent parking lot landscaping requirement. They want to just waive that all together. That's kind of a thing. Just in location though, that um, numbers, are they waiving the numbers? Want, it's not shown on the plan. Guys, I'm going to vote no on this entirely. You're just asking too much for public benefit. I, I mean, no, I, that's I, not public benefit. That's my point. <laughs> you don't want a waiver. <laughs> I, we're doing really good to yeah. delve into these details. <laughs> and, and it's hard at 1230 at night, to be honest with you. I move, I move to table this until our next meeting. Yes, I think so, too. There's I been a move and a support. I, 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 I'm, I'm out of I call a question. Okay. So, roll call. Roll call. Table. Or postpone. I think we're close. We're going to find out. Okay. Non debatable. Great. They called the question. So, roll call you know, vote on whether we're postponing. Who seconded that? Was it you? No. no. It was Makash. The other cranky guy in the room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, they deserve better than. And who called the question? We'll focus. Horizon. Horizon called the question. Okay. So roll call. Okay. Commissioner Hyde. No. Commissioner no. Sharp. No to what? Sorry. This calling the question. That. Right? Voting right away. Calling the question. And we're the voting. motion is to postpone to postpone, postpone next meeting. to our no. next meeting. So he said no. So okay. No. Okay. Are we voting on that or are we calling the question? Calling we're voting. We're voting. We're just doing it. Commissioner okay. Sharp. Uh, I'm thinking yes, we postpone our table this. Commissioner Riser. Yes. Commissioner Moore. Yes. Commissioner Chang. Yes. Commissioner Culbertson. No. Two. Carried. Okay. I mean, these people deserve commissioners who are thinking straight and aren't lashing out. I want to okay. give them the benefit of the doubt, and I don't think I'm able to do that. My apologies to you. I know you came in from far. No, I just need to ask a question, though, because we now can't get back on your agenda till July 10. So we now have sat through all the other um, cases that came up. So is it possible to request a special meeting? Because um, we are up, we really want to get, we really want to be part of this community and we really want to get this project started. And that's why it's taking you all this time to come here with this final site plan. I mean, we were wondering where you've been. Well, we've but been, we submitted it. Let's not get into an argument. And no. I, mean, I, I don't think we're opposed to not scheduling opposed to a special you. meeting. Okay. So um, how do we do that? Sorry. Do we, who do we contact to set that up? Yeah. Uh, I would like to get it. Good night. I'd wake up at six o'clock. I'm sorry, it's really hard to hear you. Um, start with uh, Fran Zuma, and she will pull the planning commissioners. Five. Yeah. Okay. Can we um not do reports tonight? Yep. No, mine. Okay. 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 We should. We need to do the minutes. However, I move for the approval of the minutes. 
Is there a second? Second. Uh, anyone have any discussion or additions, revisions? Nope. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Well, energy no. comments. Motion to adjourn. Do we have public comments? Yeah. Oh. Support the motion to adjourn. Okay. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Thank well, you. I'm sorry, I, let, I snapped at you. Yeah. Yeah. You made the motion no. or? Was more, more and then seconded. Was riser, I think. Was riser, okay. I'm just going to catch mm -hmm. up with all this. There's a lot to cash talk. department. We're not, we're not close on this one, guys. Yeah. We're not close. And, and, and I'm not thinking straight. Are you guys adjourned? Yes. Yeah.